Welcome to the Great Bays Tennis Podcast. I'm Steve Smith along with Ivan Ozeritz. Ivan is an idiot. No, Ivan Ozeritz. Uh, what we're going to do is call Dave Anderson. He's been a guest many times. He's putting the do's and don'ts together. One episode was for parents. Next was for coaches. Mm -hmm. This one is for players. Correct. And number four will be for administrators. I'm interested in that one. Administrators. So let's call up Dave Anderson. Dave is someone that's been associated with for years and years and years and years. And he's out in Dallas at the Brookhaven Country Club. Two rings. Hello. Dave Anderson coming to you almost live from Wintergreen Resort in Wintergreen, Virginia with Yvonne Osiretz. Hey, Dave. How you doing? Steve Smith hey, here. Dave how are Anderson. You guys? Yeah. Glad to have you on the podcast. Glad to be back on it. You've been on many times. People love listening to Dave Anderson. The do's and don'ts for parents. We did that. Do's and don'ts for coaches. Now, do's and don'ts for players. I know we did talk about uh, the time you and I uh, were in Boca Raton. Yeah. And uh, a couple of weeks ago, we had Lisa Pugliese Lacroix. Um, great, great lady, kind soul. Yeah. You could just tell people should could just tell me listening to her. Should people should go back and check her out online. But um, that's in a Boca Raton. So she was number one player in the South, grew up in Memphis, and then she went to Boca and San Andrews Prep. She started talking mm -hmm. about people on her team. Um, the Spadia sisters, Vince Spadia, yeah. um, Karina Marariu. But uh, it would come back and touch upon that, uh, those days in Boca. Yeah. But let's start with yeah. uh, number one. Why don't you read number one, Yvonne? Yeah, I'll read it. Uh, number one for dues for players. Put 100% of your focus on controlling your attitude and effort. Mm-hmm. Go ahead, sir. Yeah. Are you, are you calling me, sir? Yes, sir. <laughs> 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 Hey, Yvonne, can you take Steve's temperature? I'm not sure he's feeling well. <laughs> um, you have to, people, yeah, people I, listening, you have to remember, I, I've, I've known, 1985, when you do the math, how, yeah. long, how long ago is that? I've known Anderson a long time. Almost almost 40 years. So I didn't call you sir on the first day? Okay. No, I don't. I'm pretty, I'm pretty <laughs> certain it wasn't sir until just about two minutes ago. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I mean... You know, before we even go into the the number one uh, with the players, you know, I think it. Uh, you know, we did coaches or parents, coaches and players, and I think as a as a lifelong kind of trench coach, um, so far it it seems like the players are are often uh, skating out of things quite easily, and uh, you know, I have this cartoon on my phone that shows. Uh, 1970 or 65 uh, parent-teacher conference and, and you know, this kid sitting in the chair and the, the parents um, and the teacher are both kind of pointing their finger at him and saying, you know, why are these grades not like this? And 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 then it says today's world and, and the, the kid is sitting behind the parents and, you know, just smiling and, you know, the teacher and the uh, and the, the parents are arguing and, you know, the kids kind of skating out of all the responsibility and accountability. And I think that hopefully out of these tonight, you know, we can help some players understand they, they actually have a key role in this and uh, some things that, you know, there's many things we could have made a list of a hundred, but 10 things that, uh, you know, then we'll add to them, but they, they, they just, they're critical. And what Yvonne said at the beginning on, putting a hundred percent of your focus on controlling your attitude and effort. And, um, there were just, you know, people returning from tournaments all around the state uh, of Texas this past weekend. And, you know, ultimately, um, you know, I hear the same song and dance, uh, from a parental standpoint on, you know, we don't care if they win as long as they play well. Well, that's really, 
easy to say and hard to live. And, and it's the same thing. I mean, and, and if, if we could agree on, you know, as, as a team, you know, to use that word, parents, players, coach, attitude and effort has to be first and foremost. And, you know, I think that with attitude, um, the competitive spirit uh, of, of loving to fight, loving to battle. And, and it's interesting to me when these kids go off to tournaments, every now and then there'll, there'll be an event like a zonals or a dynamic duo where it's kind of a team oriented thing. And, um, you know, the kids, you can see that, or, or even now they even have some doubles excellence tournaments where it's just doubles and mix. And, and they're, you know, Thursday, Friday of that tournament, um, uh, you can see that there's a real uh, zeal in the in the players in terms of going down to these tournaments and and uh, but yeah when they're going to some of these that are you know an L two singles tournament and and uh, they don't have the same zeal so they, they they have some attitude things there maybe some scar tissue and how it's all been handled around the kitchen table or whatever but uh, attitude to me is is everything and and uh, you know, it, it often, the player's attitude is, is reflective behavior that they've learned. And, and uh, so, you know, it, to help the player, sometimes we have to help the, the support system around the house. And as far as effort, I mean, there's just no, uh, you know, you've said it a million times, Steve, and in other sports, you just get benched. And if the effort's not there, and I, I love that uh, UConn coach, Gino, I mean, he, you have, bad, you have bad body language or lack of effort. I mean, forget about effort. You just bad body language and you're not playing. And, you know, the, we don't even have to be at the tournaments to know that uh, the resilience and the effort part of it for many of these players isn't what it needs to be. And, you know, they, the, the player isn't running after balls and then the, the parents make the mistake of assuming that's a footwork issue when it's really just a heart and guts issue. And, and they're they're not running um, due to a lack of effort, but uh, yeah, I mean those are important things in my world, and I know they are in yours. And and uh, just coming from another sports background, I mean, you, you really didn't have a choice if you wanted to play. Let me just go back on a couple of things. Uh, you said trench coach in the trenches for listeners. Um, the job is difficult. Uh, you're you're digging you're digging a ditch. You're in the trench. Um, you know, it's, it's, you got to get your shoulders going. You got to get your body working to d- d- dig a ditch. It's like with, uh, David Ferrer, who's wanted to quit. And his grandfather and his father, as the story goes, said, okay, you can quit, but you got to do this for two weeks first. And, you know, is this working a shovel and, and taking dirt, pushing the wheelbarrow. And he only lasted 10 days and he came back. And from there he was, usually labeled the hardest worker in tennis, called him Pero Dog. And he was uh, mm-hmm. a couple of times voted the favorite of, of, among the uh, fellow pros. Um, but for me, uh, people have asked me to keep repeating this. Um, a trench coach, there's developing players, and then there's developing developed players. And I certainly respect both. I mean, but you know, say, for example, college tennis and recruiting. Um, they're developing developed players. And I feel sorry for college coaches. They bring, they, they get all these kids who don't even know where to stand when they're playing doubles. But um, yeah, coming back to the only two things you can control are um, attitude and effort. Um, you know, we I know we have some players that uh, we've trained that are at your place right now. And we've had a setting over the last X amount of years where, you know, we, you know, know that they don't even know what a vacuum cleaner is you know what is that Mm -hmm. it's a vacuum cleaner i don't want to mention any names uh jeremy langer a great canadian kid played played really well played a record-breaking career at the university of indiana uh, sitting down vacuuming Um, so the attitude effort when you say the attitude of the household you know what what happens at the kitchen table um you know it's it's very interesting to ask tennis players to you know pull weeds you know, they just they, yeah. they haven't got their hands dirty. But um, one other thing that you mentioned, Gino, um, Gino's last name, oh, Oriemi, Oriemi. Or, 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 yeah, good Italian name. I, I, I always, 
Yeah. Uh, he actually spoke at the tribute for uh, Kobe Bryant. I was listening to that the other day. And um, with, for years, for 15 years, I was in Tampa. I know you, you visited Hillsborough Community, mm -hmm. Hillsborough Community College, 28 tennis courts, right next to where the Yankees play spring baseball, Bucks across the street. And I couldn't go, but I freed up Chad Berrio, who was with us for five years. And I said, hey, I remember having coaches do this for like Bobby Knight, you know, big time basketball coaches, because during the NCAA tournament, Tampa would host, you know, you know where they have the Elite Eight, um, whatever. They have, you know, it's yeah. a huge tournament. So part of the tournament mm -hmm. was always run in Tampa. Now the final may not have been Tampa. So uh, Berrio comes back and says that Gino had three assistants. And he said, this is Sally and, she, you know, Marianne or whatever. He says, this, she's in charge of offense. And this is Billy, and he's in charge of defense. And he said, this is Sam, and he's in charge of getting me an effing Diet Coke. So, Sam, go get me an effing Diet Coke. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it's interesting, you know, with uh, character coaching. Um, yeah, you know, we, we all have time poverty, but – there's just so much content now. Everybody and their brother has a podcast. And of course, when I set up, we get going with the podcast. I think, here we go. Amateur hour. I've been teaching, yeah. ten, I've been teaching ten, 10 is 50 years. Um, what do I know about, a, you know, making a podcast? But um, yeah, Gino, I thought that was pretty cool. This is what my third assist, <laughs> assistant has to do <laughs> with uh, people. Yeah, I like that guy. You know, just... Uh, you know, you just show one ounce of negative body language. And, um, you know, I love watching pro soccer. When I was a, a kid watching soccer on TV, just, but once I saw it live, I saw it live in Europe and in Asia. And um, I don't like how they act for the red card. You know, so, uh, so, much, dra yeah. so much drama. Um, but the, uh, you know, in some sports, you know, you just can't act that way. It's like, yeah, you know, um, with, um, but tennis kids, they really need help in that area. Um, but it's all one and the same and that, uh, you know, the coaches, we, we have to step up and go, you know, we have to have the, the right work ethic as well. If you're, you know, if you can't be a lazy coach and expect to have hardworking kids. Yeah. I think it's all intertwined. I mean, the, the the three areas we've covered coaches players parents i mean everybody has to be on the same page with that attitude effort everything it's uh you can't you can't have really that three-legged stool concept i don't think you can have one of them off balance yeah and uh usually finding uh you know finding a stool that's on balance right from the beginning it's, uh, that's a rarity um no, it's got to be a lot of work put in. I know you would as well, Yvonne. I feel bad for not being able to pronounce Gino's name the right way, but people should look him up. I mean, there, that's one thing about YouTube. Um, just, there, there is a lot of really good things on YouTube. And to, to listen to coaches, um, I haven't had a chance to listen to uh, – um, there's, I think, the, the, the Five Truths or whatever by Nick Saban, mm -hmm. part one, yeah. part, part two. Mm -hmm. I, I haven't heard that yet, but uh, – yeah, it's someone who was talking about Jim Valvano the other day, the uh, coach at NC State. They won in '83 and won the bat, won the the basketball national championship. And Jimmy V, the speech he has, you know, um, you know, he was just on his his almost on his last breath when he made this speech. It was on uh, ESPN, the ESPY Awards, I believe. And um, so I was speaking years ago at NC State. Uh, I was with Austin Krychek and we were going through, uh, Matt Clore was a coach at that time. We were going through, we practiced at NC state and I'm an old guy, but the trainer was older than me. You know, this might've been 10 years ago now. And, uh, so I said to the gentleman, uh, do you, did you work here when uh, Jim Volvano worked here? And he said, uh, yeah, I was the trainer of the basketball team. So then what I did, I said, well, let me start asking you questions. That would be okay. And he said, yeah. And I said, they told the players, I said, you guys don't need to listen to me, but um, I don't, you know, have a problem reprimanding people. He said, Clore, are you, are you kidding me, Clore? 
is that uh, these guys need to know everything about this guy. They really didn't even know. The guy was very quiet and humble. And what he said about the basketball team is the coach, Valvano, had photographic memory, and he just knew the game, like what happened at you know 16-21 in the first half. And that afterwards, they all would go to his office, coaches, trainers, and they'd be there until the sun came up. He said, but the trainers, you know, they get beer and Coke and pizza. He said, the, um, he said, well, we were fortunate. The tra trainers, we were allowed to leave, but they would just stay there, win or lose, and they would just go over the game until the sun came up. And, um, you know, that type of spirit. He's a that, passionate guy. That, yeah. That type of spirit. Um, you know, stories just remind me of stories. And uh, he talked, he used to talk about college recruiting. He, and he, he said, this is how it works. There's some kid in landlocked Wyoming. He's a super basketball player. He's six foot nine. You got to get the kid. And the kid is 17, 18 year old. He looks at you, coach, I want to study oceanography. And Valvado said, you look, you look him right in the eye. He said, we have the best oceanography program in the country. <laughs> and, and then he said, when the meeting's over, you call up the, the right people on campus and say, can we at least get an elective and call it oceanography? Funny, funny, funny guy. <laughs> but uh, what's number two? Before, number two. Before number two. Oh, yeah, yeah. I had yeah, a yeah. Comments. Go ahead. Steve, Steve uh, had uh, mentioned Nick Saban. It's actually... Very interesting. We just um, got recently sent this clip of Nick Saban talking about how when his team switched from a mindset of winning, winning, winning to um, more in the moment, more of the process, um, where I think he said something, be 100% in every play and do that for 60 minutes. You can look back, win or lose with no regrets on the match. And that is quite a different mindset from what a lot of competitors that say related back to tennis um what tennis kids face when they step on a court a lot of you know because of the utr you can you know pin yeah. point fingers to so many different things like um you know parents and there's the expectations um but i actually had a i guess personal experience with my sister recently she you know we exchange how she's doing she's on a D1 team, um, Cal Poly slow. And she, um, she has her ebbs and flows. She does well and then she doesn't do so well. And then she internalized it too much and we talk about it. And, um, but that's is very interesting because all this happened kind of a couple of days span where I told her, um, what I had later found out in that video from Nick Saban, where, you know, if you play every point, just compete to like just get out there and just show yourself that you can do your you're doing your best how can you look back at the match and say you did poorly or how can you look back with look back with regret on the match even if you lost you did everything you could i mean you're not going to win every match um there's always most likely going to be someone better than you on any given day so you can't expect yourself to win every every time you step on court so just give your best and then can't you can't really regret it if you do and so that kind of mindset is is tough to accept um from personal experience again from talking to my sister and just from understanding that um it's really difficult to be in that zone of being 100 percent in the moment competitive and giving it your all regardless of the score not throwing a fit just being in a moment and but if you do, you get rewarded with the feeling of, well, yeah, I just played the best I could and that's that. And I feel like you get so much more out of tennis and sport in general, not just you can relate it to more sports if if you have that approach. So that's, that's my point on number one. Yeah, and I think that's great. <laughs> that's a great uh, take on it. And, you know, I think that when you, when you go through this, uh, 100% of focus on controlling attitude and effort, um, you know, really probably even more so it's, it's applicable to the day in and day out. You know, it's easier to get, not always easier, but, uh, I think it's easy to, to interpret that statement as a match play related thing. But to me, um, that's, that's getting up at five thirty, making sure you're having your breakfast before you get to the court at seven, you know, making sure you're on time and you're organized and you're doing the things in between sessions and, um, because attitude and effort, it's a lifestyle. 
I mean, that's all it is. It, it becomes a part of your DNA as in, in your life. And, and, uh, you know, you, you really, you really do start, uh, you know, it just tastes, tastes differently. I think once people start to develop that mentality in their life and, and once they taste it, I think any other, any other mental food, vitamins or anything that enters in doesn't taste the same. And, uh, most people do put mental junk food in their attitude on a daily basis. And, and, you know, you always talk about mental vitamin C and, um, you know, and it, uh, I just think that that's where, that's where we as coaches rely heavily on parents because, uh, we have to, because without the support of the parent and the parents, um, it's very difficult to teach the character of a champion. Um, but I, like when I was writing these and I put number one down immediately, uh, the, 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 the word picture association was, was Rafa. And I mean, to me, Nadal exemplifies that every stage of his life, um, probably, uh, you know, has had a lot, a lot of difficult moments in his life that we don't know about those that are outside of the, the inner circle. But, um, the guy is the guy is very close to to you know mastery in that regard. Even though you never really do master it, but he he seems to have dialed it in at a level that most can't. Rafa, my goal is my next practice will be my best practice ever. Now here's yeah. a, here's a mind vitamin we've all heard. Your your attitude is your altitude. With, uh, no, speaking about amateur hour with podcasts. Uh, Vaughn's taking notes. Uh, last time he, he reviewed the notes at the end, but I think it'd be very good if we did it uh, one at a time. But let, let's do this. Uh, Yvonne, if you look at the camera, th- we actually film these things. And at one time I talked to a, a podcast expert. She, she said to me, oh, you don't have to film. And I said, great. I said, I, why would we have to film these? And then our podcast founder and my podcast coach, one of them said, Andy Fitzsell says, no, you have to film them. But Yvonne, if you look at the camera, I'll look at the camera. So I'll say this. So get, get this on. Is that uh, Yvonne has a, he has a face for radio, and I have a face for TV. <laughs> but um, Anderson, I don't know if Yvonne's old enough. Uh, the Brady Bunch, you've heard. Oh that. yeah, I've and, heard of them. Yes. But Andy says we we need to do the Brady Bunch, and the, the, those people old enough to have wasted time watching the Brady Bunch. Those my father used to call it the idiot box, and growing growing up in the tundra. Um, 10 miles from the great white north right up the canadian border i spent some time watching 30 of the tv shows and the brady bunch if you remember dave they would have the six boxes i think it was a total, oh, yeah. like maybe 12 um yeah 12 characters they put up six and six more and um yeah we'd be excited to do that with you because uh then i wouldn't be the ugliest, <laughs> ugliest guy <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> people would people would think we're we're a ventriloquist act or something <laughs> Actually, there's, right, more, there's, there's, a, there's more similarities than differences at this stage of life. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. It, Yvonne was. Uh, I said, "Well, yeah, you can find it on the internet." And I said, "Yeah, Anderson. He's he has got. He's a he's a blonde guy." And, uh, yeah. He's, 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 but and for our listeners, is Anderson? The Lord works in mysterious ways. He was the guy who gave me the hardest time when I was losing my hair. All right, so I'm not gonna lie. Yeah, you, you, you were you were thin in, and I was I was still feathered. So <laughs> life life caught up. But yeah, you and I are the ones. Yeah. That have, you and I are the ones that have a face for radio. Okay, so mm-hmm. let's go to number two. Uh, number, number two. two. Yeah, oh, go, go ahead. ahead. Go ahead, Yvonne. Uh, you go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Um, you did put this together. I'm just reading what you have here. We have we printed it out. Yeah, no actually, worries. Actually, actually, no actually, worries. actually, just for listeners, Fred Foreman wrote it. So he's he's a brain. That's yeah, true. He's a brain. He's an our North Dakota boy. He's I, te- I know I'm just teasing, but uh, David is the second yeah. best tennis teacher from his high school in Minot, North Dakota. The best is Freddie. Is, is Freddie Freddie Foreman? Actually, Brian Peterson, who you met out in Indian Wells, he might be same high school. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay, so you're number three. It's all good. Yeah, I'm number three. All right, what do you got? All right, number two, put significant emphasis on the practice concept, skill development, and minimize the tournament point chasing. Save your nickels for when they really count. Well, I mean, you know, sometimes I feel like my life is on a loop, you know, and, and trying to <clears throat> really impress on people that, um, 
what what you you know every week, week in and week out, you're 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 trying to send the same message. Build build a game. Just build a game. I mean, I can tell you if I was like, I'd be a lot better dad now if I had kids right now. I mean, my grandkids are going to have a lot better chance at doing something. I think they're uh, they're getting a better, better, more intelligent version of me. And uh, but the the, the parents, um, again, this is for players. But I think that it's at a point where you know it's very difficult. Uh, I think the players are almost easier to to accept this kind of thing. I think the parents have a more difficult time accepting it. They feel like they're missing, um, you know. And uh, it, the I always tell people I, I would literally, and you know, I remember Steve, you holding Connor off a long time, you know, and because I remember taking him to a tournament when he was here living, and you know, he he looked like he was going to Disney World. He, he just hadn't played a ton of them at a young age and uh and i would i if if i had a young kid now in this stage i i just don't see any real benefit to playing 12s and 14s and uh i would just build a game i'd try to build a a a game that really represented a a strong, well-built, well-skilled all over the court, 10 UTR, and then I'll play tournaments and they will be a 10 within months. And uh, rather than, you know, starting the process when you're at this three and, and thinking that you are going to acquire enough points gradually to increase, to, to get a, a real game. And I mean, it, it, uh, I, I just think it's done completely upside down um and you can you know everybody has a little different route i get all that but i see families going broke on tournaments and and i know training can cost i I know that you know it's not cheap to to train at our place but um you know basically what it costs somebody to to train an entire month potentially six hours a day at our club our academy they spend that on a on a four day tournament weekend, and I just don't get it. Um, I, I think that it's uh, I don't blame people because I know they're in this system that's really we've talked about it here many times. I'm very adamant about the fact that I think it's dysfunctional to say the least. But um, I, you know, if they if they really have a dream, they'd just be better off putting their nickels in a piggy bank and and uh, saving them for for when they really do count. Because somewhere somewhere along the line, they're going to have to get on some airplanes and stuff. And and usually, people are just doing it prematurely. Yeah, all these podcasts are interconnected. Uh, Rachel Rohrbacher, who was on, is doing really well in pickleball. And if you want to do really well in pickleball, um, learn to play tennis. And, um, you know, her parents listened to me, not very many parents, not many parents do, uh, but she didn't play outside of Florida. Um, and, you know, you mentioned my son, Connor, um, you know, he was fortunate to travel. I mean, it was visit, you know, pros like yourself or go, go to Europe when, or Asia when I was doing traveling clinics. Um, every day is a tournament, you know, the ranking and the rating, like the UTR is, is is it's a ranking because if it was you're a nine or you're a 10, but once they put the decimal points in there, they, okay, now you're a, you're a 9.23. Um, mm-hmm. Well, I think, you know, how big is your circle? Uh, another way is, you know, what, what's your lens? Um, uh, before we got on, um, you know, Joey Johnson, who grew up part of the world, you grew up in North Dakota, Minnesota, and um, we've been doing a lot of video work for Spencer. He's, you know, it's a great thing. He's playing in the lineup at UCLA and he went two years on a mission where he didn't play tennis. And, um, yeah, just how big is your, how big is your circle? So now I think of UCLA, I can remember when I first went out to California and I was in awe of just being on the UCLA campus, you know, growing up in upstate New York where you had back in the day, three TV stations and you know, you get a chance to watch UCLA football, UCLA basketball back in the John mm-hmm. John Wooden days. And it's not, it's not ego. It's not arrogance. But when I w- watch 
players play at that level, um, just have the information to look at it. And, um, and that, that's at UCLA. I mean, WTATP, I mean, we had some of the best players in the world that have major holes in their game, but they're just great physical specimens, great, the term warrior. I don't really like to think of that because tennis is not war, but, um, but yeah, the, how big is your circle? How big, you know, what, what's your lens? And, you know, the five E's of player development, you used to say that all the time, enjoyment, education, experience, and then exposure, environment at the end. You know, everybody, all parents want their child to be in a safe, secure environment. Um, but the exposure, you know, you know, we're talking about, you know, the do's and don'ts for players, but going, certainly back to parents is, you know, they're going down the road for the first time. And, yeah. you know, okay, hey, how many children do you have? Well, you have two. How old is the oldest one? Well, the 15. That means, well, that means you have 15 years experience with one. How old is the second one? 10. Okay, that means you have 10 years experience with two. And, and we know kids don't come with directions. But, you know, mm -hmm. that, that's, that's um, you know, I think there's some luxuries uh, from tennis. One is travel. But I think two is I, I've learned, talk about do's and don'ts. I've learned so much from parents. But I've been asked... Uh, to write a book on the, the don'ts, not the do's of parenting, but mm -hmm. there, there's two sides of it. Um, but go ahead, Yvonne. Uh, I just had a, um, a point oh, for the second one here. Emph put more emphasis on practice and skill development rather than, you know, chasing points and tournaments and countless, countless times on this podcast, you've talked about the ITFs and uh, we joke and say it stands for, it is traveling foolishly and we have a a player here from canada and just today he came down um and started talking to me venting a little bit about his coach and his parents and you know the situation back home and um what he's gonna do because he's staying he's staying with us for three weeks went back and another three weeks he's here for and um he I, he you can see in the way just the way he talks about his future, uh, his future development. Um, he's 17 right now. So he, and he just, you can see starting to understand because, um, you know, pl the players and parents or coaches back home are saying, Hey, we can go to this ITF, this ITF and random countries. And, and, you know, very mature answer. This player from Canada said, wow, we have, I, I we have ITFs right in our backyard. If I want to play an ITF, I can just play right, right in our backyard. I mean, matches are matches. And just the way he talks about it is very mature and um it's nice to hear that you know some things we've been trying to get him to understand are are starting to rub off and he's just starting to see how it's just it's all about skills and it's all about um just becoming better and not about getting the points um and traveling to different areas to find find the points uh so that's very it's very very nice to see how you know we're slowly slowly at least in, in this particular example this this kid um this player we managed to um help him out to see how um uh, i'm not saying it's 100 percent that's how it's supposed to be but uh chasing points is is not as well is not as good for your long-term i think game as chasing skill development and really trying to just practice where you blue blossom where you planted is, is, Lost, uh, blossom where you planted uh Marv Levy, Marv Levy, I, with a uh, former quarterback uh, who was here with his daughter. Um, I watched that show for the second time. I said, hey, you'll, you'll, uh, I was doing some emails, but I said, you'll love this. He used to say that, Blossom, where you planted. And actually, uh, yeah. um, Dallas Cowboys, um, who was the quarterback? He went to Oklahoma, then he transferred to uh, UCLA. Um, Aikman. Tro Tro Troy Aikman. Mm -hmm. and, you know, he... he he was recruited and they said, Hey, Colorado, or excuse me, in Oklahoma, yeah, you'll we'll throw the ball. He got there and they weren't throwing the ball. So he transferred. He wanted to play in an NFL offense. But he said, actually, for yeah. the Buffalo Bills to get to the Super Bowl four times in a row was a greater achievement than um the Dallas Cowboys winning it. This is Troy Aikman saying it, the quarterback of the Cowboys said he goes, I I look back at it now and he goes, That's a better achievement, but getting the finals four times and winning it twice. It's like Lendl getting to the U.S. Open eight times in a row, the finals. You know, and Lendl, uh, talking about uh, Nick Saban and how tough he, tough he was on himself after they lost and the, the lead-up match to get to the finals. 
Uh, that's what cha- that's how champions think. Is it goes, yeah, I didn't do so well. I only, only won three of the eight, but they get the eight mm-hmm. eight, eight finals. Um, going back to Joel Trucker, what a great tennis mind. He said, and before we got on the air, we were talking to Dave about uh, Brookhaven and renovated a beautiful facility. And what Joel Trucker said is the junior development program should be the club directory. You know, like how many, you know, 10 year olds would be so much better off to just call up, you know, the 55 year olds at the club and say, Mr. Jones, Mrs. Jones, would you like to play a set? Um, yeah. They don't even talk to adults. It's amazing today. Junior, juniors, the children, I mean, they don't stand up. They don't, for the most part, they don't stand up, shake hands, greet parents when they come in. And it's kind of awkward to it. It would be when I was a kid, you always addressed people, Mr., Miss, Mrs., Doctor. You, mm-hmm. you know, it doesn't happen anymore here in the States. It's amazing. Um, like in other countries, yeah, in other countries it does, so. The, the kids in the online school program that we have, you know, right around, you know, somewhere around 40 when they're all here, but overall their character development in that way is different and uh, more productive for, for society for sure than uh, the kids that come after school. Um, I mean, the, you know, the, that aspect of their, their life. And I think, the interaction is kind of the opposite of what I think everyone fears about putting their kid in online school. They, they think they're going to miss out on, but I think if they're in the right culture, um, those things are almost enhanced because they have to deal with a lot of adults that are, you know, a part of the club life throughout the course of the day. So they get, they get better skilled at it. I think. Be- yeah. It's uh, desocializing. Um, mm-hmm. One reason to, you know, do non-traditional scheduling, um, what, what goes on in, in schools. Um, with, before we came on the air, let me just sound like so professional, on the air, with uh, Dave, listeners, he used a line about, you know, people hitting forehands. He goes, yeah, it's just kids unloading from the wrong side of the court. Um, he, here's something we can move on to number three is uh, um, studying other sports, knowing other sports. That doesn't happen so much in the States now. But with football, I love the football culture. Perhaps one day the sport becomes obsolete because of concussions and it's just like, whoa. Um, my father used to say it's like two mountain goats lined up together. Hit, hit. And, uh, yeah. But if you were to compare, if anybody's ever played touch football, there is no plan. Uh, it is the Buffalo Bills with Jim Kelly, the quick, the quick no huddle offense. Is you just you go to he was ever throwing the ball you just you just everybody just goes I'm going long hit me and, mm-hmm. and it's it's not this you know like the NFL or you know even Pop Warner football where there's a huddle and there's just all these details and tennis is more like touch football the way juniors are playing mm-hmm. it is touch football and doubles is um whew, it's like ultimate frisbee with no coaching it's just people are scrambling around they don't know even where to go. All right, Ivani, baby, number three. Number three, you almost said it. Follow your sport, follow other sports. From North Dakota. Yeah. Go ahead. Well, I mean, I think you know, Steve, tennis is my 14th best sport. <laughs> and, <laughs> um, and Fred Foreman's better so, than 13 of them than you, right? <laughs> no, he, he, he tied it one, his <laughs> primary sport, wrestling. He was tied. But the... Uh, you know, I, I've i always felt, uh, no matter what sport, no matter what coaches, I mean, it, it, you, you really want to develop the athlete. The athlete uh, is first and foremost. And I think it's very hard to develop the athletic culture needed to, you know, these kids that, say, are 10, 11 years old, if they only grow up in the junior tennis culture, they're not really going to be ready for that D1. You know, if they want to play – at a, at a power five D one environment, um, you do get some jocks in there. You, you, you know, sometimes there's people who have just been tennis kids their whole life, but, uh, you know, you take a guy like George who gold off, who, um, you know, he, I, he, he stands out when he's on our courts athletically and, and, uh, yeah, when he's in a locker room of a, you know, a top five school, um, there's going to be some other jocks alongside of him and, and uh, I think that tennis kids, I'm, I'm, I'm shocked at 
the little amount of tennis that they follow. I mean, it is shocking to me that this, uh, this era, I don't know when it began, somewhere in the last decade, um, even with, you know, nonstop ability to access tennis. Uh, matches that are on the tour or collegiate or, or, you know, I'm just shocked at how many are not following the sport. And inevitably, whenever I ask the question, the parent always answers, I thought, and I'm like, that's not what I asked. And, you know, I, I don't know if it's a, a barometer and, a, you know, kind of the attachment that a kid has with a sport, but, you know, I, I, I think that having that passion, having that love to where, you know, you're aware of what a guy like Jordan Thompson did last weekend uh, um, over in Cabo when he was, you know, six oh three oh down on, on Mickelson and really looked like he, you know, at the changeover was going to be communicating with the airplane or airlines on how to get an earlier flight. And, and the next thing you know, he's, he's won the singles and won the doubles there. And, and, um, but I think that if they followed it more, it would help them understand that these guys on TV, yeah, they make, they make a lot of errors. They, they regroup well. You know, the, the, the best champions on the tour are, are also the best losers, inevitably, because, you know, the, in a 4-4 in a four and four match in 100 points played, and, you know, sometimes it's, it's a, a margin. You know, I don't know if this is still accurate, but I remember reading Nadal had the career winningest percentage of points played out on the tour at 54 or 55%. I can't remember exactly. Um, and then Djokovic and Fed were right behind, but that's 54%. That's, that's, that's such a tiny margin. And I remember looking Taylor Fritz's up at that time. His was 51%. And, uh, you know, these kids go out with unrealistic when it comes down to going back to number one, controlling your attitude and effort. I mean, they go out, and they, they've got to have a realization of what this sport's about. They're not, they're not going to win 100 points unless they're, you know, uh, completely mismatched in, in, in level. And it's going to be a series of, uh, you know, getting one brick on and taking two bricks off and, and throughout the course of a match. And, and, but, but if you don't follow it, you don't appreciate that. And, you know, so number one is to follow, yeah, follow the, the sport of tennis give yourself a chance to develop a relationship with it. And, and, and I feel other kids from other sports um, follow their sports much more basketball kids, football kids. I think tennis kids follow other sports more. Um, they do follow them a little bit, but they, you know, I wouldn't say they follow them for the athletic. It's more for entertainment. Um, not really for the, the stories behind the stories, you know? I, I, but yeah. I think it's a, a key thing. I've had a chance to spend a lot of time in the Midwest traveling to do clinics and such. And I think one thing that helps kids in the Midwest is that most kids are connected to the big 10. You know, mm -hmm. they're, it's like, okay. Um, you know, I'm growing up in upstate New York, the population is so large. Um, there's all these SUNY schools. It's not like there's the university of New York football team. Um, mm -hmm. but coming back to Jordan Thompson, um, he's 29 years old. And I think perspective for time, um, I was at the Miami tournament and I was talking to um, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Spadia. And mm -hmm. Vince, Vince Spadia, you know, um, one, at one time I remember he was upset that uh, uh, he was referred to as a journeyman on TV. You know, mm -hmm. I just remember that kind of conversation with um, you know, his father and his father loves tennis and he hangs around tennis and, and, uh, but he also told me the mother was there at that time. That they were very grateful for what Agassi told him. Agassi said that he did not have a clue what was going on in life until he was 29. And Agassi had such a, um, second, the second half of his career was stellar. Um, but I think when, you know, you think of someone who's, you know, 15 years old and we tell people all the time there are two types of uh college players the blue chip and the project player and mm -hmm. you know certainly um you know someone who's a five-star player and that's not really even referred to so much anymore but one before the utr that's all you would hear you'd read a tournament well i'm playing a, i'm playing a four-star i got a really tough draw mm -hmm. and 
um, yeah, so um, just with perspective. Um, so in pro tennis, you have a, a teenage sensation and a late bloomer. Roger Federer considers himself a late bloomer. He said, you know, he said mm -hmm. many times, Nadal's five years younger. He's like, no, was no way I was that mature at, at that age. Um, but yeah, I think that people put too much pressure on themselves. And I, I think also tennis, and I've said it many, many times. Um, well, I'm in the elite group. I'm in the world-class academy. And, you know, I, I come back to hockey where you turn, I think it's 12, you turn 12, you're a peewee, and the division before that is your squirt. Hey, what tournament are you in? I'm in, mm -hmm. I'm in the squirt tournament. Next year, I'm play, playing peewee. Um, carry your own bag. Um, I have to go back to George uh, Goldoff. Uh, why don't you tell the listeners a little about George? He, he was a guest on our podcast. Well, I mean, George, you know, I've had the good fortune of, of knowing really through you. Um, you know, he was spent a lot of time with you during COVID and rebuilt a, a lot of things in his game that he's now reaping rewards for. And, you know, he's landed landed here um, following a, uh, some coaching he was doing down at Baylor for the men's team. And, and uh, I mean, the guy, to me, uh, is just he, everything we've hit on so far. I mean, he's just, he's just dialed in. And, uh, I think he, you know, you know, the, the, the thing about being a late bloomer, I mean, Thompson at 29, I mean, I, I really believe that if you take care of your body and you don't, uh, spend all your energy at the wrong time of your life, I mean, I think you can come into your physical priming early to mid thirties for sure. Um, is George, 30, George is George 30 yet? Uh, I think he's 29, Same. maybe 28. I might be giving him a year, but, um, but you know, he, he's making a dent now and he, uh, recently won back to back challengers and, um, one in Cleveland and then one over in France. And, um, even with that, he didn't make the cut the next week in France. So he had a week, week off last week and now he's beginning another one in France. Um, Yes. So he, he's knocking at the door. So he's won some challengers playing doubles. Uh, Andy Fitzell sent me a message and said, uh, you know, I guess he had copied me on what he sent George. And he said, uh, George, uh, I'm sure people are still fun, making fun of the way you volley, but pretty soon they'll be asking you how to, how to hit a volley. Um, you know, we have so many players that have been told, you know, get your elbow in, lead with the bottom edge of the racket, you know, volley with an open racket face. Now, you know, come in with a racket face at a 45 degree angle. But here, here's something with George. He's got a impressive background. He was at Baylor and they were in the finals. I was there at the NCAA tournament that particular year. And his dad was there. And uh, so George came up and I was, I was calling George Silver off. And then George told me later, he goes, yeah, my father didn't understand that. And I said, yeah, that's because... Uh, my locker room humor was a, a little bit deeper than you and your dad's. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> I was born in a locker room. Uh, but anyway, uh, yeah, George Silveroff, that's a great story. Anything else uh, on that one? Yeah, I got some some comments. Um, I consider you know myself a late bloomer in a lot of areas. Another er one area in particular is other sports. Um, you know, growing up, I, I did participate in other sports like swimming and high diving and surfing and a little bit of uh skiing taekwondo these these ones but they weren't i would say um a big part of my life and for example the, the big sports in in america at least today you know football basketball um baseball i wasn't really in tune with but follow your sport, follow other sports. Um, I'd say it's very important because I've only recently got into, let's say golf or hockey, what Steve's introduced me to hockey. Um, mm -hmm. and it's, it's very important in my opinion, because if you're stuck in your niche of tennis in the, in the niche of tennis, um, you're not exposed to all the great parts about uh, other, other sports. And I, I jotted some, some things down here, for example, in golf, just how important the grips are, the, the swings, and, and how, how much patience the players need to have, how they're just playing the course. They're not really playing other players, they're playing the course. Um, from hockey, 
um, the athleticism, the confidence that the players need to have because they're skating, skating on ice, and if they fall, they hit ice, and it's tough. Um, and the commitment they have, um, if they get in the corner, you know, Steve said this a lot, there are rewards that other players are coming in, they're hitting them against the boards. So just the commitment to, to, to go for it. With, um, with football, you have uh, this intensity paired with the strategy and like the fight of the players to just get the ball down the field and score a touchdown and all the, all the post and pregame um, meetings that go on to just, to just the, the sport and that none of that goes into tennis. I mean, and as a whole, I mean, we've talked about that and this could be another conversation about how, what sport, what tennis does that and doesn't do compared to other sports and, and baseball, let's say the, the mental fortitude or um, how many games they play throughout the year and how many they, they end up losing and winning. So they lose all the time and, and they just develop this great sense of, of, Oh, I lost it. So it's all right. I mean, it's just a game and next time. And again, with baseball, like the margins, this the baseball bats, the same side of a baseball. So you, I mean, you hit one of three in your hall of fame, all these things and the hand eye coordination that it takes. So if you, I mean, if you're not in tune with these sports, which I wasn't prior to a couple of years ago, I mean, I just didn't, didn't watch them. It was just tennis. Um, you wouldn't have such a group, such an appreciation for just the, 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 the different types of athleticism and how it could help a sport of tennis, your own game, just the sport in general. And, um, I didn't touch with basketball. I'm not quite into basketball yet. I'm sure I can learn a lot from that sport as well, but, um, it's interesting not, and not just with the athletes themselves, but I believe we mentioned this on a other podcast as well as the commentating is, is, a, is like, I think the commentating is like, is a, is quite remarkable how different it is because it's hockey for example again we, we've talked about this but ho- in hockey you listen to the commentators and they're critical they're, they're critical of the players of the coaches of the plays of the of, of, of everything they're seeing and they're, and they're not afraid to say anything about it because that's the sport that's the culture of the sport and there's no way that's happening in tennis and tennis. It's like the, all the commentators just put on their rose colored glasses. Everything's all good. This player's doing well. This player's doing well. Let's just see, have a good match and just, just talk about things we see. And there's no getting into it. There's no, how can this side do better? How can this player do better? What about these coaches? They just state the obvious and it's just a time filler. Whereas, and I think, I feel like if you're a one sport, one sport player, or one sport, um, you're, you're just like a tennis person. You listen to just the commentators, for example. You just kind of get tuned out. That's all you know. You don't hear the, you don't hear what, let's say, the commentators for other sports talk about. And so it's 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 very refreshing to to just even if you're not a, let's say a fan, fan is sort of for fanatical. If you're not, I'm not I'm not a huge fan of. I say football, American football. I recently got into it, but I'm, a, I'm a, I guess I can say I'm a student of football. You know, it's a, I watched a couple of documentaries and, and series on Netflix about football. And I, I mean, I can barely tell you how the scoring works, but I'm, a, I'm starting to become a fan. I'm, I'm really enjoying it because I, uh, just the raw, again, like the things I put down intensity and the strategy and the fight that goes into that sport. And, um, you can take that with you into tennis and I feel like it would help you and it give you an, an advantage and it, it would grow the sport and make the sport more healthy. With, with that, uh, during the Super Bowl, Ethan Matthews, one of the pros up here at Wintergreen, I said to him, well, first of all, during the Super Bowl, you were asking all those questions, Yvonne. Yeah. So learning about the game. And but I said to Ethan Matthews, who's a total football nut, not a junkie. I said, you have him withdrawals? He goes, how'd you know? <laughs> and, uh, yeah. Because they're so into it. But yeah, jack of all trade, master of none. But you know, you can turn that around too. Is that uh, in the very early ages, if you're not a jack of all trades, you just won't be a master. You know, there is a certain point in time where it's like, okay, I'm going to choose uh, one sport. I mean, I've said before, like you say, at an elementary school, if you, you could teach running technique, you could teach golf swings, you could teach, you know, body balance and tennis swings, and every kid should be able to catch and throw and, you know, run and jump. And, um, you know, maybe you don't have some expensive sports like, say, ice hockey or football, but to make everybody an athlete. Um, with, um, 
Brandon Flanagan, he's been on all these podcasts at FM. He, um, he had a private school mm -hmm. that I was teaching, you know, players, goal-oriented players a couple of times a week. And um, I was there like a spring break and, you know, the kids didn't come outside. They just played video games. But um, yeah. let me say this before we go on to uh, number four. Uh, just yesterday, it was perfect. We had three indoor courts, nine players. And I said, all right, I, you know, we had two players here. One has been recognized at a national level by the USTA and one at a regional level. And we had, um, you know, we find out when people come to work with us, we don't work by the hour, we work by the day. We do tennis immersion. So uh, stage fright, you know, can't speak in front of a group and shy. And so had some juniors and some high school players that had come from an hour away on Sunday afternoon. So we had nine players. So I said, all right. And, you know, each, we did each basic stroke and the, there was a sh show and tell and the, the young kids would, that played, that played pretty well. Would, and actually one is, uh, it's a girl just turned nine and she has really static balance wise. I mean, it's not like on the run, she's going to impress people, but she is clean as a whistle hitting the tennis ball. And I said, all right, this is what we're going to do. And we had a center, we had a quarterback, and then we, we had a uh, wide receiver. And then we had to push the wide receiver back and call him a halfback. So we had the center hiking the ball, which is basically how you, how you hit a tweener. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's a throwing motion. You have to, you know, position your legs like you would have to hit a, not a side tweener, but a, the over the head tweener. So, you know, we'd already covered the throwing motion. And the quarterback's got to have a palm down. So we're doing it with a tennis ball. So you go in shotgun. Like what, in the high school kids, one, one, one in particular, very outgoing guy, he knows football. He was mimicking when he, he was the center. He was faking like he was blocking. So we have the center hiking to the quarterback. And we have the receiver going out, and the ball has to go over their head to catch it. I remember my oldest brother, he wrote a book, um, um, Dry Land Training for Ice Hockey. But there was all these different exercises and how to become an athlete. And one is just catching a football that's thrown over your head. You know, mm -hmm. today we were working on emergency shots and this young kid, he's looking over both shoulders. You know, you, you, you can hit a, what we call a backfire, the uh, Ili Nastasi Bucharest backfire and, mm -hmm. and, you know, continental grip and how your shoulders are squared out and you have to drill that shot. And, he's, you know, he's, he's like doing a spinorama, you know, he's going 360 degrees. But they, they that comes back to they haven't played a little, you know, play play catch with the football, and you know then we make it a, eventually make it a tournament where you know okay bounces on five, five bounces you just have to make contact with the ball, four bounces you have to at least hit the net, three bounces, it's got to go over the net and go anywhere, so then two bounces, it's can go over the net in this double score, one bounce it's got to go over the net in the singles court. And then, you know, you just, you know, last man standing, last woman standing, that, that's the champion. So you end up having a tweener tournament. But the, you know, okay, do you, do you know how to hike a tennis ball? I mean, okay, hike a football, but do you, they don't even know that terminology, shotgun, quarterback, throwing, um, go long, catch it over your shoulder. Um, with um, the... Uh, Talking about edifying, Raven Clausen said that on a podcast about what you, you referred to commentators. And he said, I wouldn't mm -hmm. want to be a commentator because the commentators don't really get right down to the nitty gritty and they're just edifying. And you know, I, you know, the USTA, they get picked on for the, certainly the most talked about program in this country, the USTA player development program. So yeah, I think there's quite a bit of edifying, like we're great, we're doing great, things are super. So John McEnroe, um, shows up. This is a few years back, and he's me he's meeting. He's addressing the national coaches, and he basically goes, "I can." And this is when uh, uh, they Bianca Andrescu and you know Dennis and Felix and who else? I mean, they have, they have some top players. And mm -hmm. McEnroe says, "I can understand Canada having better hockey players, but I can't understand Canada having better tennis players." And mm -hmm. Uh, the people in the room weren't very happy with McEnroe. Is that uh, you know he's just calling them out. You know how can we have 330 million people? They have 30 million people. Um, Dom Lausick, who came out to your place to observe what you do, uh, 
you know, he's got all the stats, um, highly educated guy. We're, we're 21 per capita in developing players. Um, yeah. But yeah, in, um, in hockey, um, you know, if you, uh, you're on the ice when you score three goals, but the team scores four, you know, you're minus one. <laughs> that, that that's it's the it's the language of the land i mean the ten, tennis language with players um they uh they got they got to handle handle some tough love what do you got there number four number four learn to learn in group settings one-on-one -on -one settings and all on your own yeah well i think we're in a i mean we're in a stage of uh coaching kids where you know parents think every answer is going to be uh settled in a private lesson and you know i think it was in billy billy jean king's book pressure is a privilege where she said that she thinks that those two words private lesson have really hurt you know the development of, of tennis and players in general and and uh, every learning setting has to be mastered and um, kids need to be taught to be attentive in group settings. I mean, if, if, if one's financial means doesn't allow them to take one-on-one -on -one lessons, um, you know, they, they would have to, out of necessity, to make their dreams come true. They'd have to become very skilled at, at gleaning every bit of information in a group setting. One-on-one -on -one settings is easy. I, I, I tell parents all the time, um, you know, that they'll show up often for a, when, when I'm doing one-on-one -on -one work with their child. I always tell them they should come and watch the group rather than that because it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's never an issue to get a kid to focus, you know, when you're standing on the same court with them just one-on-one. -on -one. The challenge is, you know, how are, they, how are they performing when no one's watching and kind of the definition of character. And then, you know, all on your own. I mean, to me, that might even be a bigger missing piece of, of this thing in that, uh, you know, you, over the years referring to it as program plus Steve and, you know, and, uh, um, kids have forgotten how to practice. I mean, I, I remember taking an idea. I think I stole from you, Steve, about practicing practice. And when I first got here, I, I used to run, a free workout, you know, practicing practice. And it was primarily for adults, actually, how to use the ball machine, how to use a wall, um, drills to do uh, productively on your serve that'll help mold your technique without, you know, rather than just getting out and hitting a basket of serves, things like that. Shane Benzant uh, was a great player and, a, and more importantly, a great young man that went through our program. And, um, he had a dad who was uh, certainly in my Hall of Fame and but he used to call it, you know, ownership at the time where it was just Shane and himself with a basket of balls or a ball machine or a wall, whatever it was. And, and he, you know, he required him to do that. And I think that's how players really grow. One-on-one, um, -on -one, I mean, I think every part of learning has an important place, but, uh, I think I think that one-on-one uh, -on -one occurs every every moment that a word is said, whether there's ten people around. I mean, it's it's still said directly to to each individual, and they just need to accept it as one-on-one -on -one information. But it's it's become a lost art, no doubt about it. And what has exacerbated it is, you know, when they see a top kid who happens to be in a you know at a tournament, and the, the player might be you know already kind of a, an accomplished player or what have you. And, and the parents ask that parent, what do they do? And they said, Oh, I just, we just, we have this one-on-one -on -one coach and, and that's what we do. And, and, uh, and then everybody thinks that necessary, the, the necessary formula in, in order to get somewhere. And, you know, it's the, it's the copycat syndrome. And even when they're not copying the right things, it's about learning. For, for our listeners, uh, Shane Vincent, um, he was ranked number one in the U S I believe it wasn't, it wasn't mm -hmm. George, George Goldoff was as well. And there, people should hear that, you know, he had to change his game ranked number one in the yeah, juniors, but, uh, Raven Klassen was ranked one in South Africa. He had to make adjustments with every stroke. 
Um, but Shane Vincent, you had had him, you had him at my place training, and that's when I was in Tampa, Florida. And I can tell you, after all these years, I'm not shocked very often. And uh, we, you know, he's, you know, best player at 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 that time, and we we're having a meeting and. Sorry, Shane, let's go through a few things. Uh, tell us the best player you've practiced with. And I started walking backwards. He said, Federer. So, oh, okay. Um, actually, uh, just talking to Joey Johnson a few minutes ago, there's a possibility that Spencer could practice with Djokovic uh, um, hmm. here this upcoming week. You know, people are coming to California for the um, – the Indian Wells Indian tournament, Wells, yeah. but you know, program plus what that means is I, I tell people, I don't know of a program that develops players. Obviously you run a great program and you have the record to prove it, but in other words, how many kids, you know, hundreds, you know, 500, whatever, a huge number of kids that you've trained have gone on to play college tennis, but it's program plus it's what you do on your own. So I always say there's no program. Um, I do think the private lesson is a fishbowl. You know, you got to learn to swim with the sharks. I mean, like you've already said it, have every situation, you know, you're, even though you're in a group setting is make it a one-on-one, -on -one, listen that intently. Uh, I like to tell people uh, the cash register runs the private lesson and certainly so do uh, logistics. I mean, people aren't going to drive 20 minutes to a tennis facility to take a five minute lesson, but tell people, Hey, 12, five minute lessons, listen. Uh, it's amazing how many people don't watch lessons. So, you know, the parents that are there watching their child take a lesson, um, they should come and just watch you teach all day. If they have a day off, they should say, hey, is it okay if I just come for four hours and watch you teach? I mean, it's not backwards. It's completely backwards. You know, people come to see us and they're being filmed. And they watch their kid being filmed. It's like, hey, you're, you're going to get a copy of this tape. You're going to get a very detailed report on what's being filmed. You know, why don't you walk around and watch what people are doing? But they're just, they're watching their kid film. But they just don't know. They, they just they just don't know um the uh in one and you know on the other hand though there is this to be said is that you can't argue with one-on-one -on -one. what a what an opportunity for someone you know if and only if the coach is competent that they get yeah. they have the opportunity to take a private lesson what do you got sir yeah i have a comment with uh you know, i do call him sir anderson he's a young guy too I I actually didn't know if Yvonne heard you say that or not. <laughs> it definitely. I was listening very intently in a group setting there and heard it again. <laughs> uh, I, uh, with um, personally, in, intrinsic versus extrinsic motivation, you know, where does the, uh, where does your motivation to get better? Does it come from within or does it come from external factors? And, you know, personal, personally, from my own experience, when I played tennis, uh, when I was younger, I started around when I was eight and I started, uh, my parents started taking me to lessons because I wanted to start, I wanted to keep training and getting better and at whatever age I was. And it's like, oh, all right. And then at some point and through no fault of my parents at all, it's, it's just, it, it has to happen this way. They encourage you to keep doing what you're doing to get better at it. And there's a, a moment or this line or a barrier that some kids cross is just, unfortunately, it happens where you start to do it less for yourself and more for others. For example, well, I want to make my parents' time and money and efforts into my own game worthwhile. And that transition is slow. And once it happens, though, it's very difficult for it to go backwards because you're already thinking about it. You're already um, motivated by the wrong, the wrong, um, the wrong ideals, the wrong, the wrong things, and and that transfers into your tournament play. But um, I'd say for, I'd say mo for motivated individuals with motivated players with big goals, if, if you you can ask yourself, is is tennis an activity that you engage in throughout the day, or is it or is it your life? Is it is tennis on your mind 24 7 365 because i i can guarantee you there are players out there that have tennis on their mind 24 7 365 and those players do end up playing on tv and rising to the top so um if you have the goals you have to act you have to understand what it's like to to live in the body of a person that would achieve those goals you know intrinsic extrinsic uh our listeners, uh, 
David uh, knows Clayton Stanley very well. So Clayton Stanley is going to mm-hmm. turn 50 October 23rd. He's born 20, October wow. 23rd, 1974. So I sent him a text and say, hey, you got to be on our podcast when you turn 50. And that's where we come back to the Brady Bunch. Uh, we'll definitely have to, we have to get Freddie in one of those squares because he certainly liked Freddie uh, better, mm-hmm. better, better than he liked you and me. <laughs> and uh, yeah. But uh, David Stanley was – you know, buying state, you know, Clayton, hey, you win this tournament and I'll buy you this and I'll buy you that. So, um, not, not over the top, but, um, you know, David and I were in these two small towns in East Texas and Chad Clark was first. I think he was just a year older. You'd have to correct me if not, but, and mm-hmm. then Clayton, you know, he's like me five foot, nothing, the Rudy film, five foot, nothing, a hundred, nothing. And both these guys played at Texas played at Texas. So, um, but anyway, I think of that with, I used to, t- cause I spent David Stanley, um, you know, he had a, he had a major impact on what unfolded in the 10 years that we were in that area, East mm-hmm. Texas, because I remember I met him the first weekend I was there and he said, I got a kid and I'd like to have him, uh, um, take lessons. But he also, he said, I want him to be good. I said, yeah, okay. He goes, no, I mean really good. <laughs> And, uh, yeah, so anyway, it's, uh, I'd be careful though with, with, um, you know, promising a puppy. I mean, I'd be very careful promising this, that, and the other thing, uh, for results. Um, yeah, for sure. What's the next one you got, sir? We're on to number five, maintain sound academics, college athletics and academics must meet in the sweet spot. Yeah, I, I think it goes without saying. I mean, student athletes. You know, it uh, it's an area we're trying to get better at from our online program. Um, monitoring most of the kids do a really good job with it, but just in general, I think I think you've said it before on the podcast, Steve, somewhere along the line, how you feel college visits really should be taken somewhere in junior high. Yeah, and because most people, they just wait too long. And they wait too long in order to get the academic and athletic side. I mean, I had a family sitting on the bench on my court not long ago. And, you know, a kid was like a sophomore and and said they wanted to play at UCLA. And, I mean, I, I don't know if they probably thought I went into a temporary state or meditative trance or something, but I, I really had to sit and think if they were saying what I thought I heard them say, because there's absolutely, I have a better chance of growing hair. So do you. <laughs> and it, it just, there was, there was absolutely no way the kid was going to be playing at UCLA under no circumstances, no matter what they did, it was too late. And it didn't mean it was too late for them to be a great player. But I just think that, academically um, and athletically. I mean, you, you, you've given the stats here on the number of universities in America and, and you know, you want to, you don't want, you don't want a door to be shut because of that and uh, give yourself the best chance. You know, coach Andreas does a great job of really, I think character coaching and, you know, preparing these kids for life. And he just, he's very, very matter of fact with them. Um, and, you know, he, he, he'll just jokingly tell me, he goes, you, you, you're not even in the top 10 at Brookhaven. What are you even putting down at? You know, he, he, and, and, you know, it's, it is what it is. And he said, you got to, you got to prepare for your life. He goes, what are you going to do? And, uh, you know, you can't just hit a tennis ball and, and think everything's going to work out. So the athletic side of it and the academic side, they always have a sweet spot. And, you know, I think as a coach, we have kind of a responsibility to help people line those up because I don't think people really understand that, you know, university of Texas, you know, the email that I'm sure is sent out to many, many people that I got from Bruce Burke over there and said, Hey, I'm looking for a player for next year. And we're looking for somebody in the, you know, 13 plus UTR to fill that spot. And, and I mean, it, it, uh, it's a tough ask. And, you know, that's where, um, you know, Mason, that's a goal to get Mason, you know, he wants to play at Texas. You know, the Vons are huge Texas fans and 
listen, if anybody can do it, he can. And uh, they've got the right, right, right culture around the house to make that happen. But um, it's tough and it's, it's one school and, and uh, you, you know, you better be able to play when, when, when it time, comes time and then you better have the grades to get you through the door. And I think usually those things aren't hitting in the sweet spot. Sometimes with, they're not even making contact. With the University of Texas, um, population of Texas, I don't know, it was uh, 17 million back in the 80s. With, yeah, uh, we had, a lot. You and I were working together. We had four girls <clears throat> in the 5A finals um, serving volume in every ball. Um, mm -hmm. But for our listeners, Bruce Burke, coach of Texas, um, he uh, worked under Craig Tiley. We have all these connections. And Tiley was with us for seven years. But Mason Vaughn, um, you know, we were working with a nonprofit uh, out in Memphis, Tennessee, and that was the first time um, I met uh, Mason and his grandfather George, his father Holt, and um, you know, one thing, like say a Clayton Stanley, you know you know, or Chad Clark from East Texas. I don't think there's been anybody from East Texas since then who's played at Texas. There was a coach from Chicago who uh, was at Tennyson, Tyler Tennyson swim for a while. Greg Alexander. His two daughters, they, um, yeah. they, they played at a high level at I think the university of Florida. Um, yeah, Megan, Megan Alexander, the dad was Greg. Yeah. With, um, I was just told this weekend, um, is really amazing that a, a gentleman, a very soft spoken gentleman who lives in Charlotte says, I don't think there's a program in Charlotte that will develop a division one tennis player. And, you know, people, mm -hmm. could, people could research that, you know, I think that, um, you know, you're, you're only 90 miles from East Texas. I would think people would be searching you out if they were to do a little history on how many, um, you know, players came out of that East Texas area when we were working there. Um, but one thing about Mason Vaughn, um, I'm talking to uh, someone that we coached who's at a, a very good university, a very good business program. And, you know, in the world of track and field, you're just based on the time. You know, say, so what you, you, if you want to be on the team, you, you're, you're two mile. I think it's, I think it's nine flat. That means you got to put two, four, 30 miles together. I mean, whoa. And, um, but, you know, our, our connection, you know, so I call up Jeremy Wurtzman, who was one of our students and now, I mean, he got to be one of the NCAs and he's um, uh, now the coach at Indiana. And um, Mason Vaughn has what this young student at Indiana has as far as running. Um, mm -hmm. he, the, he had to, he basically got out of tennis because he didn't learn ball striking skills. You know, he just was so ultra competitive. He just, you know, he, he was so competitive. He couldn't slow down and go backwards and unlearn, relearn but he could run till he collapsed. And that's one thing that, that Mason had as a young kid is that we're running, running miles. Uh, you know, it could have been half mile or uh, 220. He's just going to lay it on the line. And um, I can remember, I could say I was, I was ranked in the top 10, I was ranked nine. And it was in cross country in New England, but it was just for private schools. And it was based on just your time. It wasn't based on your consistency. And I ran one race where the number one and number two players, that was their sport. I was just running it to get in shape. And it's really the wrong sport to, to do it for ice hockey. I should have been doing um, anaerobic training, not aerobic training. But at cross country, coming back to it, I mean, it helps me to this day because, you know, I grew up on a lake and yeah, I could, my thing was to run around the lake every day, 10 miles. And it wasn't, you know, I was watching kids do double jumps on a skip rope the other day. and think, geez, you know, I, when I was a hockey player, that's what I should have been doing. But mm -hmm. I was reprimanded uh, for the time I had because I never matched that time. I was just told, stay as close as you can to the number one guy. Don't let the number two guy pass you. And, but yeah, Mason, uh, so that's a side story. Go off on a tangent, but um, with the players, uh, I'm sure that'll come out and he's, 10 do's and don'ts. I mean, you just flip them over here, are the do's and then the don'ts are just the opposite, but yeah. to get the stopwatch out, you can't BS a stopwatch. What's the next one? Uh, well, one thing I would like to add to the, uh, Oh, sorry. Academic side. Um, 
you know, I heard you say recently, Steve, confidence breeds confidence. So if you do well in a classroom, um, you know, if, if you have the if you have the internal monologue of, well, if I can do well in the classroom, then well, I can I can perform well on the court. Um, also, if if you do if you have great academics or you try, you know, give it your best and and um, you you do perform well in the classroom, then I, I talked recently with a with a junior that was here about this where they. Um, they attach, you know, their self worth too much to the winning and the losing aspect of tennis. They think that if they lose, they're a bad person. If they win, they're a good person, or whatever adjectives you want to attach to that. And so, if you do well academically, um, one, you have some peace of mind saying, "Well, you know, if tennis for whatever reason doesn't work out, at least I'm competent in these areas because you know i've done tried well in school and i've figured out these subjects you know i'm better at so at least you have that and um you have more of a peace of mind on on court where you realize the winning and the losing doesn't and th if players can realize this it will help them out tre tremendously again from my own experience the little that i do have but um your self-worth isn't is and shouldn't be derived from whether you win or you lose uh, matches. I mean, you don't you don't become a, bet, a worse person by losing a match. And I feel like players play like that, and you know they're all hysterical, and um, they have these outbursts as if that is the case, where you know the outcome of this match will determine if I am a good player or I'm a good person or or I I'll only love myself if if or my parents will only love me if i perform well or do well in this in this tournament in this and so and, that, and that's not the case is that's very toxic um viewpoint on on tennis tennis is a sport tennis is what you should be and you should enjoy tennis and it's it's a way to be competitive and show your competitive side and just compete is the word rather than i gotta win i gotta win and and that's that's the unfortunate side um but Number five here, uh, tying ath athletics and academics. I think academics could be very, very um, powerful side to as players' game. Where again, like I said, confidence breeds confidence. So if you're good in classroom, you can be good in the court. David, you're from a family of five kids, right? Yeah, the youngest of five. I was the dummy. Yeah, you're the fifth smartest. I'm, I'm the sixth smartest kid in my family. With, yeah. Uh, the uh, yeah, yeah, I was the, I was the dummy. With, uh, I asked a kid one time, what type of math you're doing? Because you're talking to him about angles and such. He said, gifted and talented. <laughs> I, I go, no, no, no. That's, mm -hmm. not, that's not what I was looking for. Gifted and talented. Um, go ahead. What do yeah. you have, sir? Uh, I got number six. Mentor, give back to a young player, program, or sibling. Well, I mean, it, it goes without saying. I mean, it. Uh, our sports an amazing sport. I mean, I love tennis. I think it it's an incredible sport. I think the culture of tennis that surrounds the sport is challenging for people to develop any type of altruistic behavior. Um, it tends to uh, really breed a me, me, me mentality. Um, and you need to definitely, I mean, there's no doubt about it that um, one has to, you know, have a little bit different focus to su succeed in a in a one on one sport with a physical opponent on the other side. Um, even in contrast to golf, where it's an individual sport with no no physical opponents really, other than you know the course kind of. Um, but the ability to to mentor um, has so many positive side effects. Um, we all know. The, the, the studies validate that, you know, the, the retention of, of information is going to be much greater if somebody can teach it. So that's, that's one thing, helping the, uh, the player that is below you. You know, I tell all our kids that are, you know, some of them are, you know, making their way through junior tennis and, and they're, uh, but I told them there's somebody on this facility, somebody in this program that thinks you're Roger Feder or Sharapova. And, um, you know, it doesn't, you don't have to spend hours and hours, but 15, 20, 30 minutes with somebody 
can really ignite something because, you know, at the end of the day, a lot of the things we're saying, I mean, we're all trying to just get a kid ignited, get them sparked, get them hooked on, you know, the, and, and on the sport of tennis. And, uh, um, it, it, I think how, how that happens, I think it's different for everybody. I remember Billy Freer telling me that, uh, you know, he was a good player, one of the better players in South Africa. I think he, directly behind Drysdale, who was a top 10 player in the world for many years. And, um, but Billy said that he noticed, uh, that the better he did in his country, that girls started paying more and more attention to him when he was 13, 14, 15. And he said it, it, he, he would be lying to me. He said, if he, he said that wasn't a little bit of a motivator. So I think, you know, but everybody that, uh, is playing the sport has somebody they can mentor and give back to a young player that is, uh, you know, going to think that's just the, the coolest thing in the world to have somebody pay attention to him in that manner. Um, get back to your program. I mean, she, again, I find myself thinking back to Shane Vincent. He stood in front of all the players at our Academy Awards that we hold. And he said, you, you know, you're either making this program better or worse. And there's no in between. And, uh, you know, I think that it's easy for people to sit around and complain about things and, and young players, junior tennis players, they need to be asking how, how can I make this program better? Usually it's just through controlling their own attitude and effort. And hopefully that becomes a contagious factor. Um, siblings, I, I'm shocked at how many times I've seen a sibling not take a younger sibling under their wing and mentor. It's shocking to me. I mean, we have families here that have multiple kids over the years in, in tennis, very close to the same levels. And yet uh, they don't warm each other up at tournaments. Um, I've had it to the extreme where they've, they've called to see if, the, you know, a pro can, they'll pay a pro a coach on staff to warm them up. And I'm like, hold on, where is so-and-so? Why can't they do it? And so it's all, every every one of these points really tie together, but um, the attitude of giving back a little bit and you end up getting more anyways. I mean, um, when you're, when you're the one that is giving back, you end up getting more out of it somehow. It just works that way. But yeah, I think they're important things. And I think it's, it's become lost for sure. I think the point, be a giver, not a taker. In, in the U.S. of A and tennis, and I don't want to be doom and gloom and pessimistic, but program, it's very difficult because in tennis, the individual becomes bigger than the program. Going back to young Mason Vaughn, who's a hardworking, improving tennis player, and so is his younger brother, Brooke, right? That, um, you know, Mason should hit with Brooke and not miss a ball. You know, and I always tell the older player, the more experienced player, is if 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 the person misses, it's your fault. Dennis Vandermeer used to say, um, with family, you know, you got to be your brother's keeper, and that's really what you want a tennis program to be. You want a tennis program to become family, and and everybody's pulling for one another. Where the you know the 18s pull the 16s, and like a train all the way to the caboose in the early childhood development. I think what's unfortunate is when a player becomes, Brain used to say this, when a player becomes very good, it's not that they change, it's that the people around them change. And my father used to use the term prima donna. And it's, it's amazing to me, um, um, you know, someone has a little success in the early age groups, um, it's the people around them that, that change. I mean, they're obviously worthy of recognition, but, um, you know, coming back to what Yvonne said about self 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 esteem um sir uh yes i had yeah. a question about not a question more of a a line um an author a motivational speaker life coach tony robbins don't listen to him that frequently but i caught a clip of him talking on podcast and how he mentioned it's difficult to be grateful and at the same time pissed off it's difficult to be grateful and sad it's just it's difficult to be grateful and any negative emotion and um i feel like being grateful is 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 something 
players and people need to in, try and engage themselves more in trying trying to become more grateful for the opportunity to play such a great sport for the opportunity to just wake up on you know this side of the ground and and it's great to um to remind people that when you're grateful you know you, you see the world a bit differently you, you uh, go through life and go through your day with a little bit more of a smile and and you realize that small stuff um doesn't quite matter as much and um tony robbins back to him he recommends in the morning um you take a few minutes of your time and not just think of something you're grateful for um could be anything but you should try and experience it you know close your eyes and put yourself in the moment where you um are grateful for for let's say if it's your parents what a moment where you're grateful for your parents or <clears throat> things like that and you know it, it, it'll it'll uplift you and that'll translate to the tennis court it'll translate through other people and just overall the um culture around you will will be better and building off of the what it stemmed from you know giving back to a young player program or sibling um you that's that's just that's what it's about i mean if you're if you're grateful for your sport grateful for the opportunity to get better and play tennis um to helping helping help, helping others with the sport that you're so invested in is is going to be both rewarding for you and and for the other player so it's a win-win and gratefulness is a big part of that i think i'm grateful for you saying that uh got in the mail today uh you opened up the package kevin record it's a shout out to kevin a high school coach in tallahassee he was a guest on our podcast has over 100 people in his program and he gets everybody excited because the first day he teaches a tweener you can go to uh, youtube and just plug in uh, great bass tennis tweener and it's uh, mark hamlin's son malta he was here to visit not too long ago but he just wrote a book kevin record he's written many books but the book he sent to me is a book of gratitude uh santi garcia here's another shout out um, he played tennis at the air force academy um i know someone that we've helped with her tennis teaching panam paul Kirsten, her son is playing there right now. David, you spent a lot of time with her. But San mm -hmm. Santi is a fighter pilot um, in, stationed in South Korea. And what leadership qualities. You know, he used to come to visit many, many times. And at the end, he would just say, be okay if I uh, um, just say a few things. People are stretching. He would take command of stretching. And, I mean, he was such a leader. He's like, all right, Santi, you run stretching. And he'd get everybody to be quiet. And he'd go, all right, as we stretch, just go around the circle and say, you know, what are you grateful for today? You know, what ha what's happened so far today that you're grateful for? This is very powerful. Let's move on then. What, are we, what number are we at? We're on seven. Lucky seven. All right, read it out, sir. Develop sound routines you can execute off court to maintain and build fundamental skills. Yeah, I mean, we, you know, everything we've talked about so far has been more, I mean, it's all, like I said, it's all interrelated, but uh, a lot of character things. And, you know, I go back to, uh, you know, I, I can't remember when I first heard you say it, Steve, but I mean, it just, it's just so true. I mean, it, if you can't develop and build character, you're, you're really going to not be able to build and develop tennis players or athletes. and and part of having a strong character athletically is, is you need routine and um, ties in a little bit to the program. Plus, um, you know, doing things all on your own, you just need to have, you need to have a plan and you need to have routines and those routines should just be skill related routines. Um, you know, there's something about the, the brain and the way it hears I think for, for today's world, I think the way the brain hears the word fundamental or fundamentals. And I think they, the connotation of it is, is immediately going to propel people into an area where they think, Oh, that, that, that's the remedial work that that's below me. And, but when you, when you, again, that's why it's so important to follow other sports because, the fundamental skills in other sports, blocking, um, you know, setting a pick in basketball, um, being able to, um, you know, do a variety of things, uh, being able to bunt 
lay down an effective bunt in baseball. Fundamental skills are what make people great and make teams win championships and titles. And, and but when we when we talk about fundamentals in tennis, it's it's like people shut down. They it's just not sexy enough. It doesn't have the sizzle. And so we have to have missionary zeal to try to, you know, get people to understand, number one, they're important. Number two, they, they you know, they, they have to just have a 10-minute routine, 10-minute routine somewhere along the line in their day where they're on their own and, and uh, going through it. And um, I was really impressed with a, a young guy that, Steve, you uh, spent time with and, and connected him up here, the, the Welp family. Dylan and Ryder, the twins, friends of the Vons. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and Ryder was um, on his own. I mean, it was it was just totally on his own, going through a series of things long after class had ended, and came back to the court and and going through these things, and it was impressive. But I think it was natural for him because he comes from a, a pretty sound baseball upbringing too, um, where he, he's been around that kind of structure. I know his dad played at Vanderbilt, I, I think, um, baseball. And, uh, so it's, it's kind of the norm in, a, in so many other sports. And I mean, you just, you, you just did these things to increase your skill set, to increase your competency and your fundamentals. And, and tennis players need to, to do that. They need to just get a mirror in a room at their house and, and just go through it and just own it. And, and, you know, the more they do that, the more they give young kids lessons, the, it's a cumulative, cumulative effect that, uh, over time, like you were saying with Jordan Thompson, 29, um, you know, over time it will just build. It's just, it, it's just, you, you start looking back over three, four years, then it starts to really have an impact on somebody's, you know, point they, they get to. Character. I like how Jim Lehrer calls it the character muscle. Uh, for our listeners, he was, uh, I think we dedicated two podcasts to Jim Lehrer. Um, and, you know, he's been a guest on the podcast as well. With, I find myself sometimes putting my head on my chin here, long days, and character. Andy Fitzell teases me, Smith. I go, Fitzell, you, you watching these podcasts? He goes, Yeah, quit leaning your head on your chin. And, but if you grow up with coaching and you got to smile, I go, okay, you, you, criticism has to become your Kool-Aid. You got to, you got to thrive on criticism, but most people just don't get that. In other words, they don't get coaching, um, with, uh, you know, we're up here in the mountains and I had, a, um, I've, I've had coaches say this and, and parents say this, well, right now you don't have players and you don't have tournaments And my respond to that. Well, first, let me say this is we have character. If you were to visit, that's why you need to visit. You need to visit for character. It's not because we know a little bit about forehands and backhands. And then I, you know, I have no problem uh, saying things that uh, people don't want to hear. I said, you know, I don't, we've only been up here a short period of time, but I don't think we've had any, we've had a week go by where we don't have hadn't had a player who's a higher level player than your your son or your daughter. And um, it's you know, it's a it's a bonus. Uh, you know, you do have to get to the point where you can hit with better players. You, you know, the ball is going to be a little bit faster, but best tennis players come where there's the least amount of court availability. And what's happened with the Academy and the advent of people leaving home um, is documented. You know, that, that, I mean, certainly you know, look what's happened to high school tennis. There's many other factors, but um, you know, you, know, you said it earlier on is that, you know, the, People are spending way too much money on tens and fourteens, and um, but yeah, character one on one. But in other words, with character, well, I want to play tournaments. I want to be ranked. Yeah, but what do you need? What are your wants versus your needs, sir? Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, people brush their teeth. Um, it's a routine, and then they they accept and they understand that I don't want yellow teeth. Um, I want them looking a certain way so they're willing to put sacrifice you know two minutes of their two minutes in the morning two minutes afternoon to keep those white you know whiter teeth than yellow so um 
they understand that they uh they've never seen themselves with yellow teeth they don't know what it's like so they just trust what people say and say okay i'm gonna do this and um that's not the approach that players have with their game where we tell them you know the reasoning the rationale behind doing this routine you know just for like the 48 second drill we tell kids all the time just wake up and go through the 48 second drill and they don't do it i mean they brush their teeth again but they don't do this and um the connection uh, some isn't isn't as strong um one thing is we recently put up a facebook post on um on a kobe clip on instagram and um it's basically a pop man on a podcast talking about him observing kobe on a practice court early in the morning and it, he mentioned how kobe was you know just sweating going through the basics and he mentioned how the basics he was doing was the stuff that this man that was talking on the podcast about kobe that he was teaching you know his is the youngest on the youngest players on his teams and um he was just doing the basics over and over with high high intensity and um focus and he was just praising kobe for and at the end he he, he said kobe why did you uh why are we doing such basic drills and then um kobe responded Let's see if i can get this right he said um why do you think I, I am the best player, player in the world. Yeah, why do you think I am the best in the <laughs> player in the world? Something like that, and, and you know, basics. Uh, a tangent. Should I digress? Uh, one of our speakers on the podcast guest, mental toughness coach Nicole Erickson. Uh, for our listeners, is I tell juniors as so as one positive is learning through these podcasts is have someone brush their teeth with their opposite hand, and you know, there's many lessons through that um, with skill level. You know, I think everyone who's played a serious amount of tennis, they should be able to, and we do it with foam balls to get started, is that you should, if you're a righty, for example, you should be able to play, okay, we'll go out and play a version of mini tennis and, you know, different format of mini tennis. It's like, no, play with a foam ball and you should have fantastic technique. Granted, it's a little more difficult on the serve and the overhead, but if they really know the information, and then you know, they're actually they're programming their brain, and if they practice with their opposite hand, it transfers over to their dominant side. Moving along yeah, the line here, out. go ahead, sir. David, which sir are you talking about? Are you are you speaking to the bald <laughs> sir? <laughs> One from ND, North Dallas. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean it. It it goes without saying, and you know I see a lot of. It's a tricky thing, right? Because to me, I see some kids go through this, you know, where they will execute routines, do that. And, 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 and per, perhaps they do it routinely just day in and day out, but the, uh, the emotional connection isn't there. Um, the mind body connection They're they're not, uh, it's it's almost like they're having to read a chapter in a book and um, they're being mandated by maybe a parent or a coach. And I, I, I think so much goes back to, to uh, how people are really attached to the sport because if goals, and that's what, you know, I, I think when people write down goals, you got them, right? You got them hooked. You got them. You, you at least have a, a, a point where you can really say what you're, what you're doing isn't matching up. And uh, when, when a player has goals that are significant, they find ways to do this stuff, even just, just from their own heart. And um, many kids do it. And, and really when they're doing some of these things that we talk about where, they're, they're doing shadow swings. They may not be doing them even really efficiently, but they're, they're so attached to the sport that they, uh, you know, they go down the road further. They just have that link. And I, you know, when we were offline, see, we were talking about a great junior Ryan Harrison, who became a, a, you know, a solid touring professional. And I remember when Houston held the, uh, at West side tennis club, they held the, the tour ending championships before it moved over to some more exotic locations. And I was down there that year with uh, a young boy, Jansen Whitty, who was a tremendous, tremendous athlete that was in our program. And 
he was probably 12, 13, and, and he was buddies with the Harrisons. And, and so we were sitting there in the front row watching Agassi and Federer battle it out. And, and that was when Fed had his man bun. And, and I remember watching that and thinking, oh, my gosh, this is unbelievable. But I looked at my guy to the right, Witty, who was really could have been on a path to be a top under player, in my opinion. And, and then just to his side was Ryan Harrison watching the match at a very young age. And Harrison was kind of coming out of his seat, living every point. And you could just feel that uh, he was so attached to that match as a young boy. It was, it was unique for sure. It caught my eye. And my guy was, you know, he was into it, but his eyes were wandering and, and he was, in my opinion, more talented than, than Harrison. Um, he ended up playing, you know, triple A baseball and, and basically before COVID got brought up to the Seattle Mariners. Um, and then it got shut down. And, uh, so he was a heck of an athlete, but the emotional attachment was there at such a young age. And I think, you know, going back to the early childhood, uh, part of it is, uh, you know, everybody just likes to get, get out there and watch their little kid hit and, and do all that. And then as the kids get into tournaments, um, you got to be really, really careful. This is more for the parents out there um, in the 12s, 14s, because you can tap right into the, the heart of the, the, the motivation and such. And, and not, you know, not even really with the intent of doing it, but take away from the, 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 the intrinsic motivation that you were speaking about that makes a kid want to get up and grab a racket and do those kind of things, hit against their wall up there. You know, they may not have a great base backboard or a all in one backboard or any backboard, but they're going to find space on their garage door, on their, on their brick wall on the side of their house. And uh, those things are important, I think. Um, so it's got to, it's got to come from within. And we, we as coaches, parents, we have to, we have to consistently uh, try to try to get that attachment. I always tell our staff, you know, don't, don't pass final judgment on a 13 year old because maybe they don't seem to love it you know, at the time like you did or like maybe you want them to, but that doesn't mean they can't. And, uh, you know, we got to keep finding ways to trick them into to loving it and, uh, you know, going going with performance and, and attitude and effort and performance-oriented goals and things like that and striving for that, I think, are, are great ways to attach kids to sport. Well, one thing going back to the late Peter Burwash is that the personality of the pro – it's up to the pro to make the kid love it in one way. Um, it, and really through competency, if you can teach skills and then if the parent and every, everyone involved, if the kid comes around enough and you, they spend enough time learning the skills, they will learn to love it. People like to be good at something, but mm -hmm. unfortunately, um, say two things here to go back to Ryan Harrison. Uh, I know now he's retired. So I could say, well, he didn't have the best forehand in the world, but directly, indirectly, years gone by, I met, met the dad, Pat, and I remember the, being with the Krychecks and sitting with them at the U.S. Open. And um, but Ryan Harrison could do some push-ups. You know, I mean, like, you know, you, know, you, you yeah. might mess up and say, hey, do some push-ups. And, you know, we went through a thing in the 90s where the self-esteem, well, don't use run a lap as, as don't use exercise as a punishment. But... In the end, you got to get a kid to be able to do a push up. You got to get a kid to be able to run a lap. Circling back, um, it's great to hear these names. The twins, um, um, the, how are they Dylan hitting? Dylan and Ryder. Yeah, how are they yeah. hitting, hitting the ball? So, uh, with, I, I tell people all the time that I actually think that if you have to change your strokes, hopefully it's, you know, when you're, you know, 10 years old, you know, you're not 16 years old you know, in some ways the younger, the better, but actually changing strokes. Fortunately for most young people, it's the most difficult thing they've faced in their entire life. You know, say they're 10 years old, 11 years old, Western grip on the forehand, palm up serve. They have just an endless number of flaws that have to be addressed. And yeah. then, and, and actually meeting that head on, you know, I always say, yeah, the light at the end of the tunnel is a train coming right at you. You know, you've got to make these changes. Um, you know, the kid picks up a football, they pick up a basketball, they have a better chance of having the right grip. If a kid picks up a tennis racket, 
they don't have a very good chance of having the right grip. Um, mm -hmm. Where are we, sir, Yvonne? People, uh, people call Yvonne. Some people call him Lendl. Hey, Lendl. Yeah. What do you got, Lendl? Uh, we're on eight. Put a premium on becoming a physical specimen. Go all, go all in with fitness and nutrition. Develop athletic range by playing other sports throughout your entire junior career. Yeah, I mean, physical specimen. I, you know, we were talking about uh, an athlete in our program the other day, and certainly this athlete stood out a little bit. Um, and I said to the group of coaches I was talking to, I said that, uh, you know, if we went to a couple of the area high schools, a couple of the inner city high schools, that uh, and, and put this guy on the basketball court, I mean, he, he would, uh, he would look out of place. Um, you know, I think we got to, you know, what we often accept as an athlete in, in tennis, um, and, and, you know, every sport has a different body type that, that is needed to succeed, succeed in it and such. But I think that, uh, um, very few, very few of the kids, uh, go all in with fitness and nutrition. Um, I'm not really one to talk about nutrition, Steve, as you know. Um, but um, in terms of my own life, so I'm, I'm a little hypocritical in what I'm preaching here, but I'm not a aspiring junior player. And uh, But I do think that uh, um, the average junior tennis player eats poorly, doesn't spend enough time in the gym. The only kind of time they do fitness is when it's monitored or with a trainer. And I think the days of just having your running shoes beside your bed are gone and they shouldn't be because we all know that's, I mean, that when, when somebody gets to that point, I mean, that, that hill in Vegas that Gil Reyes made Andre run, it's, it's been there his whole life. And he, you know, he was going through things with Gil Reyes prior to that second half of his career before he became a legend. And then he got the mind body connection in the right place. And, and uh, then it then it all took off, and and I, I just think it. I, I think that uh, the fitness end of it, um, you know, I I think again going back to Coach Gino, the the UConn basketball court coach, who I'm gonna when we hang up, I'm gonna figure out how to pronounce his last name, but he, um, you know, he talked about it. He said when when a comment like this is made, then a parent runs out and gets three sessions a week with a fitness trainer, and. You know, it, it, it's just a matter of lacing them up and going, to, you know, and, and you know, jog, sprint, walk. I have, I have my middle brother, who's older than me, but he's the middle brother. Uh, he, I guess he's 66 now. Looks like he's 40. And I know he's not going to listen to this. That's why I'm okay complimenting him. But he, uh, <laughs> he um, you know, every day he's kind of like had that attitude. I mean, I don't care where he is, what he's doing. He's going to run. If they have a weight room, he's just going to go through a circuit. If they don't, he's just going to do push-ups, lunges, and and he'll get soaked every single day of his life. And uh, you know, when he when he can't run, he'll swim. And um, we just got to we got to do a better job culturally in the sport. Everything seems to have to be done with a day day planner now for for the players. You know, if it's not scheduled, it's not happening. And I, I just think that's the wrong attitude. I mean, there you can't convince me watching, you know, Scott Stewart, who we had the privilege of kind of being around, who was certainly a hard worker coming out of Beaumont, Texas, and oh, I became love, a great love that player. I love, yeah. love that guy. Yeah. Could, if, I and, you know, if, if we could have coached him when he was a kid, watch out world. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, every day of his life, sprinting a mile. I mean. And uh, I just think that attitude has to come back. 104 temperature at one time. I go, Stuart. Yeah, you know, his father's a cross country coach, uh, British, right? And he said, uh, yeah. at least run a mile every day. It doesn't take long to run a mile. Just run a mile every day. You know, sometimes you're going to jog it, but he would just, you know, hey, I'll, I'll take the shower. I'll take the last shower and he'd go run a mile. Unbelievable. Um, here, here are a few, a few things on food. I was with Dave one time. We're driving into beautiful Brookhaven and we stop. And uh, he's kind of like, well, I don't know what I'm going to get. And the person looked on the other side of the counter and said, you want the usual? 
two chocolate eclairs from Mountain Dew. <laughs> <laughs> Another time, uh, I remember with uh, yeah. Anderson, I he said, where are you going? I said, I'm going to cross the street to Oregon, order a sandwich. And I said, do you know why? And he said, no. I said, because I know you're not going to have lunch. So I, actually, the, yeah. way, the way you work sunrise to sunset uh, with, uh, I one time, great guy, I haven't seen him forever, but Louis Cap, who was still working, um, on court, Dennis Van Meer runs the Boston Marathon every year, I'm having breakfast with him, and he puts Dr. Pepper on his cereal. And he looked at him and he said, well, if you run 20 miles a day, you could put Dr. Pepper on your cereal. <laughs> um, I, was yeah. at, I was teaching at Boca West in 1980, Boca Raton, Florida, and the 1980 Olympics were boycotted. They were in Moscow, but Billy Rogers, the best marathoner in the world at that time, just watching him work out. Been fortunate to see so many things. And... Dr. Haas, remember the the, um, the famous yeah, diet, eat to win. Eat to win. Yeah. In fact, Gary, mm -hmm. Gary Alpert, um, one of our associates who now works for you, he used to mm -hmm. give lessons to Dr. Haas. And he say, he would say, mm -hmm. don't, don't say anything to me. Just, just hit balls to me for two hours. But he gave this lengthy speech. I went to the workshop. He gave this lengthy speech. And Billy Rogers came up and said, I eat whatever I want. I just make sure I brush my teeth. You know, because when, you, when yeah. you when you work out like that, but uh, here's something on uh, you know fitness. You know, I love uh, Francis T. F. I don't really know him, although I was around him for two weeks. He's calling me Papa Smith just because he he so he was clever enough to remember I was Connor's father, and uh, I know my son played some doubles with him. And um, I should be able to tell you the gentleman's name it escapes me right now. But he he uh, was taught to play tennis by Joey Johnson, who's also a part of our network. And then he got really hooked on uh, physical fitness and he worked in the NFL. And for a short period of time, he was in charge of fitness at the uh, USTA and didn't work out. He'd let him go. But what he said to TFO and, you know, his background, he's, uh, and again, TFO is a great athlete in the tennis world, but um, the gentleman, he didn't really like the work ethic overall of the pros compared to the NFL. And he said to the TFO, he said, hey, Francis, where I'm from, you'd be a manager being in the NFL. I can remember uh, Jody Johnson. We should get him on our podcast. He had the Rocky Balboa gym in uh, um, Tampa, Florida. And there was a group of maybe like 10 coaches at that time from Ferris State that spent their spring break with me. And for our listeners, they still have a, a PTM program, professional tennis management. And these guys, were mm -hmm. they wanted to be teaching pros. And I mean, I said, you guys are, we took too many vans. And I said, we got to go to this Rocky Balboa gym. You guys are just going to sit down. You can't talk. And you know those physio balls, those half physio balls. I mean, there's some mm -hmm. there's some guys in the off season from the NFL working out, pro golfer. Um, you know, there was a high school kid who used to be there could um, break a four ten a four ten mile. Um, but yeah, that's that's some rambling. You got some thoughts from California, sunny California? Yeah, I got a thought. Um, I wrote down: the more you push yourself physically, the better you will be mentally. Um, you know, if you, if you, if you, most tennis kids, like you've mentioned, Dave and Steve, they don't, um, they don't tend to push themselves physically very much because they think their business is on the court and that's all they're doing. But if, if, if you know you can run a, you know, 430 mile, if you can jump through the roof, if you can do, you know, 100 push ups in a row, if you can, if you, if you can do all these physical, physical feats and, and, you step on a court, you you know, like, hey, I can outrun this person. I can be physically better than I know I'm physically better than this person. Um, it gives you a great advantage mentally because you 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 understand how you have the upper edge in the athletic portion of the game, and um, you can hang with them, and you can you can surprise yourself. Um, I feel like, and so, yeah, don't um, don't. Uh, Keep keep work on the physical side, I'd say, and um, it, it also it's just it's just more of a a, a, a pride thing, um, where you, you if you if you have you set goals, let's say weekly goals, just like push ups. Okay, I can do forty push ups in a row right now. Next week, I'd want to do forty five, and you achieve those goals, and you realize you're progressing, and it doesn't have to be in tennis with results, but you're progressing as a person, and if you're growing and progressing, you'll, 
I can tie it back to what we were talking about. You'll be more grateful. You'll be happier on core and you'll just be mentally more stable and you'll perform better. I mean, everything, everything's one. I spoke to Natalia Sorkin, a Russian. She's came to us as a mom first and then hung out as an intern and now coaches. And she has a lifetime in tennis. Uh, she's forever saying that uh, mental toughness comes from fitness. Um, I worked with a young man who played at A&M and then he was fifth year, I remember coming up to me, he was just helping out with a team and I was at the NCAs and came up and this happens to me quite often. He apologized because I blew it coach. I should have changed my strokes, but uh, Iggy, I think I have it right. Uh, Rob Kreitchuk, Rob Kreitchuk could tell me, uh, Austin Kreitchuk could tell me because you know he played at A&M and that's where Austin played. But his thing was if, if someone doesn't vomit, it's not a good workout. Um, in Moscow, I've been there many times, they have running programs. So you say you've never been there, never been to the running program. You just show up. And um, I told this young uh, girl that was here um, with her brother from Atlanta. I said, you come back to visit. And I said, I just have you run, you know, around three, four courts, one lap. And I can tell, I, I will, I'll be able to tell if you've done what I've told you to do from a fitness standpoint. And her brother, I said, you know, I can just watch you hit one backhand. And I will be able to tell. I said, we'll film both. We'll film you again. We'll film you running and we'll film you uh, hitting backhands. But you drop your child off and, you know, and, and they just, you just go in there and you run. All athletes show up. All athletes show up. In Europe, parents from the US of A, if your kid shows up at a tennis program and they don't have running shoes, the coaches are going to look at you like you're cross eyed and not, not here in the US. We're ready to move well, on I nine think, or you got to go ahead, David. Well, I was just going to say, you know, what we're talking about with fitness and uh, being a physical specimen, I, I think that, you know, we've, we spoke about it many times, Steve, how when people hear the, 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 the great base, that there's an automatic association with just technique and many parents make that mistake and players make that mistake. And, and, you know, when you, when you really think of the, the pie, I mean, there's technical skills, tactical skills, there's uh, mental, emotional skills, and then physical skills. And, and um, you know, routines that we talked about with technical skills, for instance, um, you need to have routines for physical, you need to have routines for mental, everything. It's, it's all tied together. And, uh, you know, but I, I think that, uh, it's forgotten about, um, and it's easy to, you know, to, to try to forget about it because it's, it's uncomfortable if you're going to do it well. I mean, again, um, I think that it, you know, that's why I, I mentioned playing sports throughout your entire career other than just tennis. And, and, you know, the time is obviously such a factor. We all have time poverty to some degree, but, um, you don't have to play on an organized team. Um, you know, 10 yards to my left right now, there's a basketball hoop. And um, when I was, when we were beginning the podcast, I looked out and my son-in-law was taking our grandkids out to the, to the number three hole right behind our house. And they had their clubs and they were just going to sneak on in the dark, basically to try to hit some golf balls. And they just need to be athletes. They, you need to be, you know, and, and you need to pursue sports. Um, that can help with your athletic movement, with your overall fitness and nutrition. It, it, it's all linked up, and uh, sometimes the uh, the littlest things can make uh, the biggest differences. But that, yeah. One thing with a great base, um, that expression, um, first impressions are everlasting. So when we give people a choice, okay, okay your choice, many times they'll do a static balance drill. And I one time was at the Smith Academy in Indianapolis with um, two players, two players I had taken out to your place. Um, and with, um, we went to lunch and one of the dads was with us and, you know, they were tennis tech snobs. And I go, what do you think guys? And, but those players were working so hard and our players, um, you know, looked at it from a technical perspective, but that, that is one thing the first impressions are everlasting. Well, technique, technique, technique. And then also when someone comes in, 
One, if they have poor technique and you need to change that base overall. And then two, if they're not a very good student and they're part of the million time club, you got to tell them a million times to do the same thing over and over again. Um, we, you know, we had someone here, a young 18 year old from uh, England, we filmed him running and just showed him. And he said, you know, it was like, OMG, oh my God. And he just, like, he just, he goes, I am changing that. And that's, that's where the human spirit, you can accelerate the process to change anything. Yeah. Yvonne. All right. Next one we got number nine. Never be too cool for school. The greatest athletes in all sport constantly pursue the improvement of fundamental skills. Yeah, I mean, we've covered a little bit of that. I can't remember when it was, but it was within the last month. Um, something Andy Fitzell had posted on his Instagram, uh, I believe it was, and it showed Kobe. You know, Kobe's name always kind of comes back in these things, and, and he was working you know, just diligently on, you know, the the fundamentals, free throws, you know, making a pivot, taking a jump shot, a fade away, this, that, the other thing, all things that, you know, he's, he's done for decades already in his life, but he was doing it at the peak of his career. And, uh, um, I think what happens is most people have limited exposure and they go to a tournament like Indian Wells and, you know, they see a, a player getting match ready and they assume that's the extent of what has happened in their life to get them to where they are. And uh, they they haven't been behind the scenes to, you know, to watch how a player like Djokovic has trained throughout the majority of his life to put himself in these positions and, and uh, some of the modifications that they've made in their games and, and uh, you know, the constant pursuit. You know the, the, that a guy like Sinner has modified in his serve to over the past uh, eighteen months, two years to to try to get to get better, and how he's trying to go forward. And and now I notice Sitsipas is certainly uh, for whatever reason kind of trying to follow that suit a little bit on his serve. Um, but yeah, it's just it's nonstop and. If you understand, you use the word or the term Steve lens. If you, you know, if you're looking at it through the wrong lens, if your, if your world is, uh, is, is too limited in the lens that you're looking at it through it, it I, I think that people can get too cool for school. Somebody can, uh, can lose humility. And once they lose humility, then it's very difficult that, you know, we're, we're in Dallas, Fort Worth, and, you know, I've, there, there's just tennis players everywhere in this city, much like South Florida. And, and uh, you know, that's where when, when these people go off and, and uh, th- you know, start chasing things that they think matter and, and really they should just be planted right back on the tennis court, on the practice court, just building better and better um, skill sets. Make, making their skill sets more excellent. And uh, it's hard for people to do that. It's hard for people to do that. And I think you said it best, is that oftentimes it's not the player. Um, it's not the athlete themselves. It's the people around. And then eventually it does ripple into the player's DNA. But I like Dave Sector's yeah. uh, comment where um, the kid's having some success and the parent becomes intoxicated. And you, yeah, you can be drunk on many things. It's not just drunk on alcohol. I love the expression "too cool for school." That brings back memories. Uh, OC and TC. I don't say that like I used to. Uh, you're either mm-hmm. you're either one or the other. We had some kids stretching today. They were just OC. They were just out of control. I mean, they weren't really stretching. But TC is a total total control. Coming back to Joey Johnson, that guy's always always been asking me questions. And actually, when he was at this two year school that you and I spent a lot of time at. Mm -hmm. Uh, he was always asking me questions and it was really awkward. I mean, remember he he played David Pate was a really good tennis player. David Pate used to, Mm -hmm. when he was 16 years old, used to practice with Billie Jean King. It's amazing. Really good 16 year old boys. Like say Larry Gottfried with Chris Everett, Uh, Sharapova, all those years I'd be down at Politeri's. She was practicing with really good 16 year old boys. Oh, I mean a really good 16 year old boy. I mean, I'm talking, you know, world-class, 
But so Joey asked me uh, co- questions about, you know, in, right in front of the, his team coach. He's playing for the coach. He's, oh, Steve, I was playing this match. Can I ask you? And, uh, but he was just, you know, that, that's happened so many times over the years. Like the young person's just naive, innocent, pure. And they, um, you know, we had Alex v- Vukovic on as a guest. And he was at the, it's very well known in this country, the Junior Championship Tennis Center. And, you know, mm-hmm. he was there with, um, you know, oh, Mitchell Frank and uh, Dennis Kudla, Junior Ore. And, you know, he was just, hey, he saw it and he just didn't realize there was any politics involved and said, hey, you need to get the racket further below on the forehand. But anyway, coming back, Joey Johnson said, said this, uh, this question was, Steve, if he gets a chance to practice with Novak, and it might be more than once, what should he ask Novak? I said, he doesn't need to ask anything. I mean, all you got to do is watch him. I mean, I've been in players' lounges where Novak's there, and you know, Raven Clausen said, "Yeah, he doesn't even put a, a speck of sauce on his. You know, he's not going to. Everything is going to be like total, total discipline, and you know, and he's he's stretching. You know, he's just, he's stretching. You look around and go, well, the best player in the world, the guy who's ranked number one right now, he's stretching, and nobody else is stretching. Um, mm-hmm. Number nine, what do you have, Yvonne? Time to move on to 10 or you got some? Yeah, I just had a couple examples that came to my mind with the fundamental skills. Again, Kobe, where, um, you know, he had to make so many shots. Um, I think the number was like 300 made shots every, a daily, I believe. So, no, he, yeah, I, th- I believe it was 400. But was regardless, 400. regardless, what he would do is he would be on, you know, not at the practice facility the day of a game. He'd be right, right there where the game was going to ha- where the game was going to be played and as a visiting team would come in and he would go uh 380 can't i'm I'm going to get 400 before we play can't wait to get on on the court with you guys i mean in your face black bomba you know i mean uh kobe bryant no but the i mean the fundamentals just shooting shooting shots um i remember tiger woods there's a interview with him you know what was your what's your daily routine like and it was quite intense. You know, I go on a four mile run in the morning. This is Tiger Scent. We're talking. Then I go go to the gym. Then I go to the driving range for two hours. And then I go to the putting green and make a hundred made putts from a certain distance. And if I, in a row, and if I miss a 99, I have to start over. And I mean, you can relate making a putt from two feet to, um, you know, swinging, just to drop hitting a forehand. I mean, it's, it's, it's very similar. Another example I have is, um, Connor Maynard, Maynard, I I might be mispronouncing his name. He's the young NFL star. Um, he, um, was drafted recently and I think he plays for, I know what their logo looks like. Again, I'm not, (laughs) I'm getting, I'm slowly getting into hockey, but, um, he football. You're slowly getting into football. I'm slowly getting into other, most other sports, yes. But um, I just know of this one. I guess you can call him a star, young star, Connor Maynard. I believe his last name is. And he, they had a um, a show on him or a segment on him on the network after a game or something like that. And they just talked about how his upbringing and like why he got so good because he was ridiculously good for his age and he was i think the number one draft pick or whatever it was some some i I don't remember the specifics but and he just talked about him in his driveway in the morning after school on the lunchtime like it was just his life where he just sit stand there there's a goal in front of him he has a you know stick doesn't matter what the the degrees the temperature has outside Oh, Connor um, Bernard. I'm sorry. Oh Bernard, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. I thought I thought you were talking football. Connor Bernard, yeah. Bernard Bernard CC. Um, uh, I apologize for that, but so he, he, he was, you know, just doing the base, like, okay, I'm going to shoot here and try and make it, make it. And then he says, I would just do that for hours and hours and hours every day. And, you know, he, he kind of, kind of shrugged his shoulders one time saying like, what do you expect? That's all I did. And that's how it got so good. No, a Connor Bernard story for sure. I mean, there's, he goes, the family wants him to go on vacation. They're going on vacation. They're going to go to Hawaii and he doesn't want to go. And he does go, but he what he does when he gets to Hawaii, they didn't want him to take his hockey sticks. There's no ice, but all he did when he was in Hawaii was just stick handle and shoot, stick handle and shoot. Yeah, it, the, the formula is there. I mean, whatever it is, yeah. music, whatever, poetry, whatever it is, you got to take a deep dive and you know, 
it, you got to be consumed. It's not, well, I love it. No, sometimes you don't love it, but you're consumed. You're into it. Yeah. 10? We're on to 10. Have an attitude of gratitude. So we had talked about this briefly, but thank your parents, coaches, and do the little things like writing tournament directors a thank you note at the com at the completion of your tournaments. Well, I mean, you touched on gratitude. I mean, it it's just doing the right thing. I mean, that's all that's all that really is. It, uh, like I said, the the sport, if you're not careful, can uh, breed a a level of, uh, of of me 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 that that's unhealthy for the individual. Um, you know, you watch the way kids are running around at tournaments and speaking to their parents, and uh, um, the way that the parents may be catering to them, and and, and it's uh, it's it's just not healthy. It's not real, and. Uh, you know, it, there, there, there is a, there is a luxury in being able to travel and stay in hotels and, and play tournaments and, and get coaching and, and, you know, be involved in a weekly program somewhere. And, um, you know, I mean, when is the last time that we've been at a tournament and, and you see kids, stepping out on the court with roll drives to roll dry courts when there, uh, when there's been a rain delay. Um, occasionally you might, occasionally you might even see some parents do it, but, uh, most people are just sitting around on their cell phones and complaining. And, uh, you know, we've for years talked about the tournament, uh, directors receiving a thank you note. And, and there, there are a few kids that are doing it. Um, and, uh, I've had a, couple of tournament directors reach out and and say that it's not it's not doing it for the recognition it's just the right thing to do I mean, those people are out there working uh you know sunrise to to midnight and uh to put on an event for these kids and and with the little amount that they're funded you know it, it's really a thankless job and i i just think that our sport overall there there's a reason that you know, going back to when I was a little kid that people used to call them tennis brats. And, um, you know, I feel responsible for making sure that uh, the people that I'm around each day don't uh, h help build that, you know, that terminology, that, that reputation, but rather try to put it the other direction. Um, and, and it can be done. I mean, it can be done, but attitude of gratitude. I mean, it, um, whether, whether it's, you know, the player, the parents, the coaches, whatever, I think if we all go into it with that, with that type of uh, approach, it's going to be a better place for us to, you know, to, to exist in, in the tennis world. That's certainly well said. Uh, the standards have gotten lower and lower, um, with, you know, the program that you were in to learn to be a competent tennis teaching professional pro manager, whatever, occupational competency in tennis teaching, pro management. You guys, we'd have gals, we'd have visitors come in and I'd have to get a copy. I mean, I needed to get a copy of the thank you letter. That mm -hmm. you know, anyone who came to interview people, anybody came to uh, make a presentation. Um, my parents would say this. They would see how some a kid was doing certain certain things and they would say, um, their parents are making a fool of that kid. Um, not that I wasn't a fool 98% of the time, but with, I mean, it's just like, that's wacky. That's not right. I mean, there's so many things about American society now. Oh my word. It's like if, if, uh, your father and mother could come back, uh, like my father and mother could come back and just see what's going on. It's like, holy Toledo, um, really nice woman. Not too long ago. Um, I was saying, well, you know, I, you know, my daughter's out on the court and I can't get her to eat a banana. I can't get her to drink water. And I mean, that's, that's an expression. I mean, I told this lady and I said, sorry, but that's, you know, I would just stop doing that. Um, you know, it's amazing how the parents that run down to the courts and, uh, I mean, you and I were kids, David, I know I'm 10, about 10 years older than you, but there was no parents coming out and 
handling you uh, coconut water and you know opening up the granola bar. I mean, it, no. it, I mean, it's not bad. It's not bad. It's real bad. And that's where in other parts of the world, um, you know, I just take a deep breath and go, oh, you know, America were to go to war. Uh, that, that's an expression that people don't hear too much is that if I, if we were going to go to war, I would pick that kid. Yeah. And, you know, the players, I mean, you know, just from World War II, I mean, it's terrible. There's every, every time in recorded history, there's been a war on um, planet Earth. But, you know, Braden used to say things, you know, uh, open racket face on the forehand, the kid's going to be dead in the water. I mean, it comes, comes from World War II. Um, mm hmm Yvonne, what do you have for us? Yeah, I have a, we have a post going up um, on Facebook. So here's a preview because it's um, it relates to what we're talking about. And so a quote um, from a question that was asked to Harry Hopman, um, Mr. Ho Mr. Hopman, what do you think is the most important thing we can do for our players to improve them? What should we be searching for as coaches to evaluate where they can get be able to help them and find potential greatness. And his answer was make them good people in life. That is the most important thing you can do as their coach, no matter what level they get to make them become good people. So when I read, um, your comment on, um, you know, writing notes on the completion of tournaments, the tennis directors, um, that's what that reminded me of. I mean, it's just, uh, it's, 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 it's being more than yourself. It's, it's, um, thinking about other people. It's, it's all the good qualities that persons should have. And, um, it, uh, needs to be spread throughout the game and, um, it'll make not just tennis better, but the community and people around it, um, better as well. I mean, Roger Federer's famous quote or, he stole it from somebody, but you see it occasionally. It's nice to be important, but it's more important to be nice. And, and uh, you know, I think of my dad when when I read that about the, the – my dad was big on that. I'm terrible at it, if I'm being honest. Handwritten notes. You know, my dad, up until the day he died, basically, he, uh, he, he was very good about handwritten notes to, to people, you know, people he'd run into or – uh, to to us as kids or whatever, and uh, you just get them through. Uh, by the got to be honest, by the end you couldn't even read his writing. But it was, uh, you know, he took the time and you know made a stamp, put a stamp on, and and uh, just did it the old fashioned way. And um, la two weeks ago, I had a visitor here from Oklahoma and a really strong tennis family. The the older sister had stopped by here and I, I mean, I had nothing to do with her success, but she was a very good junior, Gracie Epps, um, right around the age of Ashlyn Kruger. And I know they competed a bit out there and Gracie ended up getting injured and going to college rather than, uh, maybe bypassing it. And, um, but this Gracie was just passing through and I, all I did was really arrange a few kits for her in a match. And this was years ago. And, and, uh, next thing I knew, I got a, letter in the mail from Vancouver, which I, I couldn't re re think of who it would be from. And it was uh, a handwritten note from her saying, Hey, thank you for taking the time on July 4th weekend to, you know, be there and do that. And uh, she was on, you know, up there playing a circuit of tournaments and, and took the time to do that. And, and, you know, like life often does it two weeks ago, her sister, her little sister, 13 year old ended up on the doorstep and, um, she spent a few days, three days, and, and actually got videoed and did some work on her game. And um, Sure enough, shortly after her departure, uh, uh, same thing, handwritten note, boom, boom, boom. So what, whatever that, uh, you know, attitude of the household is there, um, they seem to be doing a lot of things right. But that that's just not the norm these days. Um, Already I've had numerous. Go ahead. What's that? Go ahead. You got. It. Go ahead. Finish. No, it's all right. Go ahead, Steve. Um, Artyom Pogaimi uh, from Moldova. I believe his mother and father were both fourth in the Olympics. Might have been the East, might have been the European Championships. One in uh, um, the broad jump and one in rhythmic gymnastics. 
Is that correct? Rhythmic, rhythmic. Rhythmic gymnastics, thank you. So uh, he said to me that most American tennis players, junior tennis players, don't know how to make spaghetti. I said, come on. And I started asking, and he was right. You know, if you don't have any money, you're having, you're, you're having spaghetti for dinner. And mm -hmm. here's something else, which is along the lines of the thank you notes. Ask a junior tennis player where you get a stamp, and they won't, a lot of them will not be able to tell you where you buy a stamp. You know, granted, you know, email, email, email. Um, but with that, uh, I think with the do's and don'ts, we just need to flip-flop it. We don't have to cover the don'ts because all you have to do is, again, turn it over, yeah. reverse it. Um, I can't speak German. Um, I once went in a restaurant, um, and there was a parrot who could speak more German than me. Be heist to be heist to. But this, you know, this helped out all the years I was in, in Germany. Nice zo, zoner zo. Even saying that, I make a mistake. I one time was riding the train and with one other man, and he sneezed, and I said, Gesundheit, and he said, where are you from in America? But, uh, <laughs> you know, just, just to flip it, but uh, I think we should make this a full-length uh, podcast. I think it's important to come back to the, the, the do's and don'ts for tennis administrators. I think many, yeah. many times there's no conversations on the growth mindset, the development of the players. It's all about money, money, money. I mean, so we, we can talk, and I know it is a business, but let's go back just for a few minutes and we'll sign off here. Um, appreciate, yeah. all, appreciate all your time, these marathon podcasts, which uh, talk about character. I've had people tell me that they've gone back. You know, they didn't uh, listen to a podcast till like were two years into it. And they went, they've gone back and they've caught up. But I do like to think that there's some golden nuggets in these things. But the corner of the world that you were in with me, um, early 90s, mm -hmm. um, that Chris, the Seguzo Bassett is now Chris Evers, right around the corner. It works out. Uh, Rick Macy is at a public park that, you know, the Florida Tennis Association doesn't manage many public parks, but you, well, you there's a huge, uh, you know, the three wall racquetball. There's a huge wall you drive up and it's, you know, Rick Macy sign. And then there's um, a USTA sign. And mm -hmm. it's a public park and it's certainly, you know, there is, it is a great service, but in some ways, is it really run in the spirit of the public because everything is so expensive? Yvonne was the one who said, I got to get someone on a rainy day to count how many times it says Macy and it's 344. Yeah, 43, 44. He's way, way up there. But, uh, and, you know, in, in Boca, when I first went to Boca in 74, um, like St. Andrews Prep or Florida Atlantic University, that was considered out west. You know, now that's like right yeah. next to the ocean. And it's just gone further and further west. And actually, when you and I were there, um, you know, you, it, ha it hasn't gone that much further west because um, you're pretty much right next to the Everglades. Um, but I just wrote down a few things here is that here's someone who uh, has a very successful podcast. Uh, Jonathan Stokey is someone else who has a very uh, successful podcast. I've listened to many of the episodes he's had and I have with Daniel Kiernan, but, uh, this mm -hmm. is just to, uh, um, let you know, uh, Anderson is that he doesn't remember you or me because he was I'm not, I'm not surprised. <laughs> he was maybe 13, 14 years old. He was with yeah. Angela Buxton. Angela mm -hmm. Buxton had won, uh, Wimbledon. Angela Buxton was Jewish and wasn't really allowed into many tennis clubs. You know, Thea Gibson, African-American, um, she wasn't allowed into many tennis clubs, but they, they uh, were a formidable pair and, you know, and won, won major events. Um, but she wrote a, a letter. Of course, it's, I have it, but it's not digital. I mean, I'm sure, I, you know, someone could dig it out in the archives, uh, microfilm, and go to the library and research, research, dig, dig, dig. But... Um, she had been in tennis quite some time after her playing career. And the article that was written in um, the London Telegraph was all that I thought I knew something about tennis. And it was all about, mm -hmm. you know, scratch the back and point and down together and up together, um, come over the ball, stay down. Um, but yeah, he runs an, Daniel Cameron, he runs an academy in, in Spain and uh, has a very successful oh, podcast. Yeah. But I heard him say, you know, that, um, you know, when he was, it was, the trip was sponsored by, uh, Range Rover and 
Um, and they remember they were there a month. Um, yeah. And I remember one, one, you always, you know, there was one gal and this has happened to me before. I remember years and years ago, a really nice tennis player, um, Tina Sawyer. Um, I was not the tent team coach and but the team coach asked me to help her with her serve and, um, Ricardo Acioli, who's been on our podcast, I mean, he sees her at Wimbledon all the time. But it, was, it wasn't Tina, but Angela had an English, they're all English players. And I remember there was a girl, yeah. there was a girl who do video. And the thing was, is their mother was her coach. And I remember Tina's mother had helped her with her tennis. And it's like, whoa, you know, it gets to be, um, I've got myself in trouble with just, you know, all you're doing is critiquing someone's stroke. And it's like, well, someone's probably going to be offended um, the, um, but I, I wrote this down, Karina Marariu, uh, 28 in the world when Wimbledon doubles. And all I was doing is remember charting her matches on the compu tennis album brain surgeon comes out with her, what a program she had, but I eventually, um, convinced him to let, let me just show him film. And then once he saw the film and she hit the ball really well, but there was uh, some issues with, uh, this and that. And. She, but here's the key is that you were talking about tournaments. She only played two national tournaments. Yeah, she didn't chase it. And, uh, but they were on a mission. They had a plan, but long-term development. What we are is great base tennis is fact-based instruction for long-term development. And um, you have to have all court skills. Like Braden used to say it's physics, not philosophy, but he did have a philosophy. You got to be able to hit every shot from every position of the court every surface singles or doubles and well, i think yeah george is a good example of that too i mean he was one in the country in singles in 18s and definitely didn't have all court skill development at that time until you know he luckily bumped into you and rounded out his game and now he you know he's putting himself in position to to, to get onto the atp tour in doubles and you know he's at a point with his skill well, sets mid court in but that are a, just, you know, they're, but they're it's separating. A, it's a story of circumstance. Uh, he was supposed to come and work with me when he was 13. His dad, which I think was great, he graduates. I mean, he's playing tennis at the University of Texas, so that's high-level tennis. Yeah. And he came and spent, I don't know, a week or two with me when I was in Memphis with his nonprofit. And he had to stay and get his degree before he could play. And I gave him a reading list and said, well, you know, he said, well, I'm going to give lessons. I said, well, you, you, you don't know enough about tennis to give lessons. But I said, you're going to give lessons, give lessons this way. Peter Burwash, be 2% selfish, work on your own game. And then, you know, he didn't do that. And um, I, re I recommended that uh, he go to Florida. Matt Clore was uh, with the USTA as a national coach. I said, go hang out with Matt. You will work it out where you can stay at our place. We have, we've got a place where you sleep 20 people. And... um Matt will just have you, uh, you know, you'd be sparring partner for girls. Didn't do it. Uh, Carla Navarro has been a guest on our podcast. They say, recommended the same exact thing for her son, Cuba. Uh, even people you've known a long time. And, and I think they, mm -hmm. uh, like a Carla would say, yeah, yes, they have respect for what you do. Um, you know, her brother who was uh, number one in the world in the 14s, way back when you were there, you came the, yeah, same, year, you came the same year as she did, is that, you know, you know, the language barrier, they're from Bolivia, or the credibility is that he never learned to serve really well. Oh, he's got a great life and is doing this and doing that. But, um, yeah, so many, so many things. Um, but with, uh, you know, played two national tournaments. And he's been on, said this on the podcast before, is that no one's going to remember who wins uh, a weekend tournament in Miami. It's like Jimmy Rogers said about Dennis Shapovalov. Um, and I know Alanis Hamilton, obviously a great player. She's represented the U.S. Uh, Cole Reeves, who we've trained, trained her. And she spent so much time with us. And now she's spending so some time with you. And and uh, she could skip Junior Wimbledon. If they were listening to the podcast. And, uh, and Tessa, Dennis's mother, goes, it's just a junior tournament. It's just a junior tournament. And, um, yeah, so many things. Um do you remember, uh, I said this when we were talking to uh, Lisa Puglis Lacroix. She mentioned as well on my high school team was, wait, what were the name of the two Spadia girls? 
Luann? Luann, Luann and De- Deanna. So you were there and I had this on film. Yeah. I, I showed it at tennis teaching conferences for some time and I could dig it out. I still have it. Is it was uh, Vince Sr. It's uh, Vince Jr. at that time, you know, man, that kid hit the ball well. I mean, he was, you know, 17. It was, you know, he wasn't zoned in on it all, but it was Arthur Cohen, who was one of the owners, Carlene Bassett, Robbie Seguzo. And I said, well, let's just film it. And I said, I can change your serve. Just give me 15 minutes. I just remember like yesterday, I put a ball under the front heel. So mm-hmm. she was, so she, it would be easier for her to, she had to go forward for one. And, you know, to, to get, to turn the knees. And but, but then I had her just run, hit three thir- serves on the run. And so she'd have a low toss and, you know, just they'd do this, do this. And, you know, she was obviously, I think both sisters went on and uh, both are lawyers. So I mean, bright kid and she made the changes. And uh, had it right there. Boom, got it. And Vince Senior was so excited. He goes, great. Now she can play a match this afternoon and serve the volley. Um, <laughs> with, uh, well, and at that time, at that time, both the sisters, one was an Easter Bowl champ and one, one was an Orange Bowl champ or finalist at that time already. No, I, I, made the- yeah, I remember uh, uh, Julie Scott from Tyler, Texas coming down and, and, uh, and practice beating one of them. And, like, and they had no mm-hmm. idea, like, who is this kid? from Tyler, Texas, mm-hmm. uh, it's somebody who can just run, hit and compete, run, hit and compete. Um, with, uh, you no, know, one thing reminds me, I go back to Daniel Kiernan with Angel Buxton. I mean, we could, we could have a podcast on just that time. Um, with, I don't think we have to get into the, we could, I could, uh, for sure. I know you could as well. Um, I was the director of the Academy and I was a director of the mission Bay club. And with, uh, mm-hmm. you know, just so many things, uh, you know, uh, the owners found out that well, I got people to volunteer time and people to come in and they just wanted to, you know, you know, watch tennis being taught. And they say, well, uh, just let the whole front staff go and run it with volunteers. It's like, okay. <laughs> okay. It was, it's, I mean, so many different things, but, um, and at that time, Rick Macy, he had overbooked courts and bedrooms and he wanted the worst way to be part of it. And you're the one who told me, he said, Hey, just get in the car and go. And I would, I would mm-hmm. not spend a lot of time watching the Williams sisters train. Um, but you know, it was crazy then and it's crazier now. Um, that little, yeah. corner, that little corner of the world. Um, yeah. Do you remember Andy Roddick coming by? Uh, yeah. We didn't teach uh, him, but he came by to, re- you remember Jason Hazley? Oh yeah. Played at LSU. I remember the Hazleys. Yeah. yeah I remember Roddick coming by to play him and, um, he, Roddick yeah, was... Hazley, Hazley had worked with Gullickson. I remember we, we went over and ate dinner at their house and they were showing us VHS tapes of him working with Gullickson. With, uh, well, I go way back. Tom Gullickson, who was in, I think, Palm Coast. Way back, Tim Gogson lived in Boca for a long time, mm-hmm. and uh, with I'd already worked for Braden, and uh, Tim Gogson had come to Braden's, and so I had a connection there as well because Tim spent a lot of time with um, Karina before we did, but actually Hazley spent time with Gogson after we did. If I, I oh, was it. that after? Yeah, and. Um, but Andy Roddick was so competitive, so feisty. And he was very much like John. Um, yeah. you know, I did some work for the Roddick Tennis Academy and, you know, Aunt John wasn't there, but, you know, he approved it, obviously. And I saw him at the US Open thank for the opportunity. And I said, you know, I used to coach against you, Clayton Stanley, Chad Clark. And he said, victory or death. But, yeah. you know, Lawrence, the oldest son, you know, he actually used our curriculum bringing up, uh, is it J.C. Roddick, who's playing at A&M, but with, uh, you know, just to see that the tennis at that time um, with Andy Roddick, you know, he, he, if you've been around him, he's yelling out, I can't volley. But but could he work and could he fight and could he compete? And and uh, I think his podcast would be a little more successful than ours. It's already on TV. It's on his third episode, and it's on the tennis, cha- <laughs> tennis channel every Sunday night. Yeah, he's fun to listen to. No, he's 
he's funny, funny guy. NASCAR. Like, yeah. Dude, I just can't understand yeah. why people would want to watch something for four hours. All they do is turn left. The, uh, yeah, he, he definitely got an athlete's mentality. Yeah. I mean, I, I liked it better when people asked him about the serve and he said, I don't know how I serve. He, you know, now he's, you know, I've heard him say, well, it's all in the legs. And so we all can step out of our lane. That's for sure. And, uh, Stan Bostit, who, uh, is from South Africa. And I was on the tour. I was on the road with my son who was playing on the tour. And he was, uh, fortunate enough to be hanging out with Stan, who was a USDA coach. And, um, Stan tells the story. Well, Andy was just frustrated. Andy tells the story. Yeah, we have it on film. His mother, I think it's Blanche, said his serve was pitiful. And uh, and he had palm up. He had a regressed palm up. And he was frustrated. He just put the racket in the sloop position. And then he had the um, abbreviated service motion. And boy, it was his, all the forces getting the arrow. You, you, you can't see forces but you can see movement and that body of his is right in that power line i think he's like mm-hmm. four and a half feet he's so far in the court out to the right on the first serve um but just to be around that you know hazley who obviously became a very good player um you know he went through a lot of technical teaching with us and um it takes a lot longer to develop you know the type of game that that we teach you know where okay you know, what happens when you teach a kid to go to the net, they go to the net and lose at a faster rate. Um, but uh, why don't you give us a thought or, thought or two? What comes to your mind with uh, Boca? Well, I mean, you, you've mentioned him. I mean, there's one of my favorite uh, kind of kids or stories that came out of there were, uh, you know, we, there was a talented group of kids. That, you know, it, it quickly became – a buzz around South Florida and, uh, you know, the, the start of that Academy and, and people were shifting from, uh, different areas of the, of the state. And, um, you know, several stories that really come to mind, Candace Fuchs, um, who, when we went down there originally just to kind of check it all out and we had drove down there and that young girls, I think she was 11, maybe 12, from San Diego. Um, father was Axel. I can't remember the mother's name, but, uh, and there were some suggestions that were made to her just in our week stay there. I think we were there shorter than a week, maybe before deciding to, to go ahead and give it a go. And, and, uh, when we got back there about a month later, you know, she had already started to make some of those adjustments, this little girl. And, um, she was impressive just to, you know, in terms of just a, a lot of things, you know, you wonder, and I, I think we spoke about the path that she ended up down and following and, and then, but one of my favorite people that I got to go on court with there was Graydon Oliver, who I used to call Hollywood. And, uh, you know, he was uh, part of this kind of group, group of under 14 year old boys who he was by far, you know, in the middle of the pack, there was uh, Kyle Porter, uh, Alex Herr, and uh, Robert Kendrick. Um, some some kids that were all top teners, roughly. And then Hollywood, Graydon Oliver was kind of, uh, you know, not not in the in the cool kid crowd at that time. But he was really one that listened well, and uh, you know, I I, I like that. Out of out of that crop of kids, you know, Oliver ended up, I know, transferring eventually in college and and making a little bit of a run at it on the pro tour. I think he got into top thirty in the world in the doubles, maybe even higher. I, I can't recall exactly, but um, just a lot of names like that. Um, you know, pe- people uh, um, that we, you know, Seth Rose, who. Um, you know, I, I had more limited time with him than you did, but uh, I can remember vividly sometimes I was just with him one-on-one. And, and it was it was a fun time for me because, you know, we, you know, when we talk about one-on-one teaching and that, I, I really love one-on-one, but it's not because it's a one-on-one private lesson for money. I just, I like that part of it a lot, being in that situation with a student and 
because back then when we were in Boca, it didn't matter if we taught one on one or one on ten. It, you know, we we were in a you know how how we were uh, trying to set it all up financially. See, we just it was a flat flat salary, and uh, um, but I remember I tried to get on court with Seth as much as I could. Um, I thought he was a great kid, and to to see how he ended up in, in the Hall of Fame at South Carolina, I believe. Um, yeah, All American. Yeah, and yeah. With uh, had a, he's a kid who had a late growth spurt. For parents listening, is hang in there. Um, I remember yet from there, you went to Brookhaven. You've been there ever since. Uh, I remember, uh, you know, Welby Van Horn set this up with Phil Eisenberg, and I was offered the job to be the national coach of Puerto Rico. And the um, reason I didn't do that is that my kids, like your kids, your two daughters at the time, were just melting in the, you know, so I said, well, yeah, my kids are like you know, three and four years old. I'm going to go in, to a place where I'm just going to teach indoors so they're not melting and, and, and help them with their game. And um, yeah, so many things. Graydon Oliver, he actually went to Alabama first, I think, and then he went to Illinois, he transferred where he played for uh, mm-hmm. Greg Tiley, who was your classmate and spent so much. So you guys spent obviously years together. Uh, he played on every major court, you know, doubles. Um, yeah. You know, and he, you know, his buddies were Roddick and Marty Fish and said the same age group. Um, I do remember Candace Fuchs being a really good player and, uh, Richard Hernandez came down many times from Toronto. He's been a guest on our podcast and Michelle Greenwood, you know, all these yep. years later, she's a lawyer now and she came down and, and it was, you know, this young kid from Ontario. I think Candace Fuchs was one in Florida. She was, you know, anyway, she was highly touted. And, uh, I remember Michelle won and, but you know, we, Robbie Suguzo, Carly Bassett, great people, but it was like, Hey, you know, they were very young and, you know, they were on the side of tennis where they were being serviced instead of servicing others. For the listeners, Carleen got to be eight in the world, and Robbie was one in the world for five years in doubles, 21 in singles. Um, I can remember uh, a kid named Brad Hasna uh, from the mm-hmm. Inner Mountain. Who, you know, he had changed, we helped him change his game, and he was very athletic to begin with. And he went from being unseated where he won the Inner Mountain. And I, you know, we've always done, I say always, since the eighties, done pre and post videos. I would have a pre and post video of you from 1985, seriously. And, I, and uh, I, I think my, mine were perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Your hair was better, but, but anyway, yeah, Brad has been, that's right. But I remember, uh, showing Robbie, he said, this kid just went to Intermountain 18s and, uh, and Robbie goes, it's Intermountain 18s. Anybody can win the Intermountain 18s. That's what he said when he looked at the video, the pre and post. So then the kid shows up and Robbie's hitting balls with him and the kid's an athlete. And Robbie goes, this kid, mm-hmm. is, this kid is good. And I go, yeah, Seguzo. I mean, I knew him since he was 10. I go, yeah, Seguzo. He's a kid. Let's go back and look at the video. He wasn't always good. He, he made all these changes in his game. But um, with uh, you know, so many things, if, you know, if the biggest, biggest word in the dictionary, where we worked, uh, I there, it was there years later um, the USTA was there, but even before that, they were in Miami. And Paul Roeder, who was a, a gopher when I was a gopher, he, had his, he eventually got his PhD in biomechanics. He got it in Fullerton, and he was a, a gopher for getting aerial when I was a gopher for Vic Braden. And actually, Paul Roeder, I think you know, I would say based on the meetings I had when they had a really decent handle on you know Braden, Braden's contributions to tennis. Um, but at one point, that facility we worked, that's where, now it's Chris Everett's, but that's where the USTA, um, yeah, um, that's where their headquarters were. And, and mm-hmm. it is, it's a pretty active corner of the world. And we were there and, and um, you know, you know, certainly we've gone on and diff- done different things, but there's still battles to be fought there. And, you know, I, people ask me, what do you do for a living? I go, I fight, fight, fight ignorance every day. And, you know, Yvonne sitting across the table, a very bright guy. Um, he's been in that corner of the world. Why do you make a comment about, you know, just all the tennis that you saw? You're from Southern Cal, where there's a lot of tennis, but what, what comes to your mind is an impression of uh, being in that corner of the world. You know where Panera is. Yeah. <laughs> you know where the restaurants are. I mean, um, that corner of the world is, uh, 
too too nice. It's um, if it's too nice, the prices are too high for homes for blackberries at a grocery store. <laughs> it costs too much. So yeah, um, people that live there, they need a you know find a way to make money to live there. So um, it's they want to in regards to tennis, they are looking for ways to get you know players and have them stay around and have them um, be part of what they're all about, either whether it's academy or a group session or something like that. And um, it's, it's, you know, going back, I, I visit, I visit my, um, my parents, I go back to California and I visit the, the clubs and the academies that I used to go to. And um, I catch some, some lessons or some, you know, just some group sessions that I, I used to be a part of or I or I, I knew about and very interesting how different I what to through what lens I see them now. And it's, you know, I just instantly I see all these little things just through my time here where, oh, they're, you know, half the players are just standing around or, you know, when the coach is talking, some kids are just laughing, you know, you know, there's no not very much structure, but. Um, on the other hand, I can completely understand from the point of view of the pros and the and the coaches, um, where it's tough to act out and it's tough to say exactly what you mean or you want to say or what you feel like would be best for the player, where you're you're afraid or of losing your client. Again, it's not they're not clients; they're players, but they're almost treating them like clients because that's how they can afford to live where they are and the paradise of um, Southern California. So it's not a great, great um, place to go for, for, you know, for fundamentals, for um, getting what you need as a player, as opposed to what you want. And they're great at doing that. They're great at providing a service. Um, I'm not saying everybody. I, again, this is a generalization of just what I've noticed. Um, um it's, it's it's they provide a great service where if you want to just be a participant in tennis yeah i mean there are tons of places but it's tough to find a a place where um you know has the right culture and it has the right the background and um pathway to become a great tennis player uh and again i'm not nothing no, nobody or no program in particular is just what i've noticed you know going back and after being here for a while. So there is uh it's well put. There's so much tennis, but it doesn't mean that it's quality tennis. There's a lot of quantity with, um, coming back to, uh, character. If people listen to a podcast, um, with Sophia Patel a few episodes ago, um, like to announce that Sophia is going to work with us and have a title of network coordinator. We, we need to, uh, as I told Vic Braid one time, we need to get the troops together uh, to help fight ignorance. I told Steve Campbell, who's a director at uh, Wintergreen, uh, uh, he was in the same program you were, David, to become a tennis teaching mm -hmm. professional. And I said, Steve, if I'm on the phone, I'm either helping someone to get a job, I'm talking to someone about college tennis, either the coach or the player, and then it really, as we're talking about today, is mistakes the parents are making, sorry, or, or they, need it, they need some guidance. Or also with what to end off with the players today, and this is something I got to follow up with, with uh, you know, I'll talk to one coach and then a coach will talk to the parent, but uh, Casey Curtis, who was a uh, guest on our podcast, um, he's in that corner of the world now. He's California, he was in Canada forever, does a great job. He's out there early, works hard, you know, basics, fitness, gonna the old school tennis, cross courts, and can you can you keep the ball in play? And he's had a you know success working with players. But one of our coaches, Casey offered some, one of our players to come and practice, no charge. And uh the player didn't go, the player slept in. So then the coach who arranged it. You know, the player was at the Battle of Boca where Casey Curtis rents courts from Rick Macy, who runs his academy, but also um, his group runs the Battle of Boca, this money tournament, every weekend, 
every weekend, 52 weekends in a row. But our former student, current student, I mean, he was visiting us not too long ago. Um, he didn't stand up and he didn't shake hands. He was in the, and the coach was just saying, Hey, this is the coach who invited you to practice. Maybe you could come another time. And you know, what he should have done is stood up, look him in the eyes, shake his hand. Don't give him the dead fish and apologize and say, thank you very much. Gratitude, everything we've talked about in this. Um, mm -hmm. So for me, um, you know, there is not one penny in it for me to go and be the bad cop and make the phone call, send the email. And um, that number three is very discouraging, but a lot of times it's only 3% respond. You know, it's, it's just, it's just where, yeah. it's just where it's at. Final word from Davey Anderson. What do you got? We'll sign off here. So we, we uh, don't break the well, three, three hour mark. Yeah. I thought it'd be fun to, you know, I have a lot of respect for Holt Vaughn. Um, got a lot of energy, right? He and, he and his wife, Tracy, she's got an equal amount. She's a lot more pleasant than he is too. We, um, we should get him on the podcast. He's a guy I gave personality lessons to. Uh -huh. no, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, we, we can get him in. But, you know, I said to him uh, earlier that uh, we were going to get together tonight and do this. And I said, why don't you give me, um, as a former player, Holt was top five in Texas, I think number four in 18, and played D1, and now he's raising three kids. A little better um, athlete than Steph Curry. They both went to Davidson. Yeah. Go ahead. Well, good that, player, that's though. debatable. Good player. He is a good player. We, he, he, he's the one who's responsible for my wrist injury. We split sets last Sunday. Good spirit. Woke up and I couldn't move it. But uh, we, uh, I said, why don't you give me a couple of things that you think of when you were a player and as you're trying to raise your kids to be players um, that you think are important. You know, we have a top 10 list and, and it'd be fun to just hear yours. So I'll, I'll just read a couple of these. Uh, number one, I always be the hardest worker. Everyone respects a hard worker. Working hard is contagious. Number two, learn how to lose and develop the skill of resilience to fight back and improve. Number three, be a leader and respect everyone. And, you know, he just kind of threw those out. And I think they're so important. And, you know, there's, there's a lot to learn from everybody. Um, there's something to learn from everybody. And, and, uh, you talk to anybody that's been through the sport as a player and achieved a level at that, say, Holter, you know, went on, played collegially and still playing as an adult. And, and they'll all tell you the same thing, that the skills you're going to learn on the court as an athlete are going to carry over into the rest of your life. Your problem-solving capability, your ability to play within a team, your, uh, your, your, your positive approach under adverse situations. Do you tank or do you dig in and compete? Uh, it's going to carry over into your work life, your, your, your relationships in your life. And, and um, so I think that, uh, you know, we covered a lot of things, you know, we could have, we could have went through a lot of different things from a technical standpoint or tactical standpoint and done all of that tonight and trying to help the players. But, but really the gateway to all of it is through the character and through all these little things that we covered and, and when you get those right, um, the other stuff is much easier to put in place. So, no, oh, well, thank you, Holt. That, One thing with uh, yeah. George, the grandfather, they, mm -hmm. they came, the first time they came to Memphis, I said, well, you know, we have this setup. It's kind of like a bed and breakfast, and we have a similar setup up here. But so, yeah, George, the grandfather, Holt, the father, then I mean, Mason, the other the other two boys were just too young at that time. But um, Holt, what a great guy, his wife as well. So the whole family. And Holt works for Apple Watch. Um, now I'm going to ask him to have Apple Watch sponsor the Great Base. But he was the people. Get, get he, said, he said he said you never wear the one he gave you. No, 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 <laughs> no. That's not the story. The story is he gave me this watch. It's worth a lot of money, and I gave it right back to him. I said this is probably the rudest oh. thing. As I said, I said I cannot accept this gift because I cannot wear it because every time I see a junior tennis player look at their watch for a text message or an email, my heart rate goes up. So <laughs> I will never wear a watch where you can look at your watch. I mean, 
you know, tennis kids, the parents, if you're listening, don't let your kids wear a watch to practice. I mean, you know, fine if you give them a fancy watch. Um, and there's, yeah, there's a, lot of, there's a, lot of, a lot of history to George and his background and Holt and background and how he got involved with Apple. And that's a, that's a story based on fitness as well. So, but no, that it was that, you know, also too, um, if a kid, parents, these are golden nuggets. If your kid is ever, and I tell people all the time, and Andy Fitzgerald says, could you say that again? I tell people all the time, uh, and maybe this is the original line. I don't have too many original lines, but you don't live your life to win. You tell people, no, you don't live your life to win. Sorry, you don't. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, Ty Tucker was a, a guest um, on the podcast, and um, he's like the sergeant from the old TV show, Gomer Pyle. And, mm-hmm. you, know, you know, a junior tennis player, parents listening, junior players listening, the do's and don'ts, they are not prepared. Overall, they are not even closely repaired, prepared for a competitive tennis, college tennis team. No, but there's also, you know, how many, how many college coaches in the United States get up every day and go, we're going to win nationals, you know, or do they get up and it's a pretty cush job? Like we're going to push the envelope. And uh, so anyway, if you're a junior tennis player, uh, coaches as well, I, the, you know, the coaches are out there, uh, you know, looking at their phone during practice. It's like, oh boy. I mean, would that work in the football culture? But yeah, don't, during the water break, go look at your text messages. I mean, uh, Jim Lair, you know, one of his books, uh, Total Engagement. But uh, David, thank you very much yeah. for your time. Podcast yeah. 187. Yeah. Uh, we'll have to tally. How many times has Dave Anderson been on this? Uh, it's quite a few. And what's it going to take you for you to get uh, your childhood idol, Freddie Foreman? I'll have to get him on. <laughs> Maybe we'll do that with Clayton Let's Stanley. Clayton Stanley's 50th birthday. And, uh, you know, Fast Freddie. Uh, Paul McDonald called him Instant Party. What a personality. Yeah, we got to get, we actually, we need to get everybody in the same room to do it. Yeah, that would be good. We should have, we're up here in the mountains. I don't know, maybe your place in Dallas. We should, you know, it's, uh, I'm going to be 70 this year. And it's like uh, one of my coaches, Tina Krinsky, Julian Krinsky's wife. She is the greatest. She, she says, Steve, what are you doing? She gives me the hard time. She says, you are doing the wrong thing. You know, talking about, I'm, mm-hmm. I'm still in the trenches. She says, you just need to teach tennis teachers. And, uh, but yeah, that's something we got to come back to the, the workshop, you know, we got to keep fighting the good fight and, and trying to improve tennis. Um, anyway, Dave Anderson. Yeah. Yeah. North Dakota. Appreciate y'all having me. Thank Threw you. Y'all in there and, Dave, uh, you. sir and sir, you guys have a good night. Yeah. You All well. the best to you, your family and everybody else in the Brookhaven community. Adios amigos. All right. Okay. Take care, guys. Yeah. Thank you. All right. That was a Boston Marathon for uh, a pretty good runner, not a great runner. Super runners are they're they're, uh, they're much faster than three hundred one. But uh, anyway, uh, wave goodbye to the camera. We got the face for radio and the face for TV. Um, we got to get the Brady Bunch going, where we have a bunch of different faces. Uh, one eighty seven, I think, at two hundred. Uh, let's shoot for two hundred, where we can improve our format. We, we, we have Sophie Battelle working for us. What we need to do is go back to show notes. And um, you know, I think also, too, is uh, it's not the name game, but just the, if people were to listen and the, the connections we have uh, for the people that we've worked with, um, you know, we have to come together to try to improve tennis teaching. Everybody's so busy. But, um, you know, even people that years ago, you would go back to the 80s. Um, you know, with uh, there is a, a network that needs to be connected and, and for the good of the game. But everybody, 187 in the books. Yvonne, thank you for all your work with this crazy podcast we have. Yeah, of course. Good night. Thank you.